It's time for Windows Weekly. Paul Thorat's here. Richard Campbell's here. So is Windows 11 23H2. We'll talk about that. Copilot comes to commercial customers today, and it's the end of the line. A fond farewell to one of our favorite Microsoft executives. All that coming up next on Windows Weekly. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Thorat and Richard Campbell, episode 853, recorded Wednesday, November 1st, 2023. 10 out of 10 for the 404. Windows Weekly is brought to you by Nareva. It's a first. Nareva's new Pro Series, the HDL310 for large rooms and the HDL410 for extra large rooms, give you uncompromised audio and systems that are incredibly simple to set up manage and deploy at scale learn more at nareva.com slash twit and by lookout whether on a device or in the cloud your business data is always on the move minimize risk increase visibility and ensure compliance with lookout's unified platform visit lookout.com today Happy November! It is time for Windows Weekly on this November 1st, 2023. Uh, the last uh, Windows Weekly in saving daylight saving time. We'll be, oh, yeah. we'll be reverting to uh, standard time next. Are you Paul Thorats mm -hmm. in Mexico City? Are you? You're. Yeah. You never change. Time never changes. They do not. Uh, not anymore. So they they don't observe it. Uh, so when things change on Sunday, we'll enjoy one and a half days of being one hour off instead of two. <laughs> yeah, Better really than well two days of one and a half hour off. On the yeah. right, Richard Campbell from Runners Radio. And of course, he's in British Columbia. Welcome home. Thank you. It's good to be home. And we've coupled our time zone to whatever you guys do. Yeah, so you kind of have to. You got we passed a law that said if, if the U.S. decides to stop changing in the Pacific time zone, wheels chop change. Oh, really? Yeah, literally. Wow. Love it. Well, we had a we had a uh, referendum in California a couple of years ago saying we we want to stay on daylight saving time, but that's not yeah. legal because that's changing our time zone. So we'd uh, have to have federal approval for that. So it, it accomplished nothing. <sighs> Sigh. Well, anyway. you know the federal is so functional. I'm sure you could get a bill. Oh, no problem. Run that right through. Oh. Sorry, which federal government? Who? <laughs> Who, what, when, where? Hey, at least you don't have Argentina's uh, new, <laughs> soon to be president. Right. Um, let us talk about, forget politics, forget time, because there is no time in Windows world. Here let us go. talk. Uh, Should we talk actually, about your Leo, tweet? That... Should we start with your tweet? It's the, oh, the top, just... on the top of the list. Paul Thorat's tweet. I have, I have ideas. And then I have them at the wrong time. And then I say, screw it. I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> so three minutes before we started the podcast, I was like, you know what I'm going to do? What? I'm going to bring a laptop. Oh, in here. No. I'm going to set it up next to my existing laptop. Oh, I'm no. going to configure it to work as a remote display. And then I'm going to connect to it wirelessly using my laptop. And uh, that took about 25 minutes, not but three. But you got, it, so you got I did it working. You got it working. <laughs> yeah, because it's hard. I, at home, I have two. Of course, at home, I have a 28-inch display or right. whatever. So I have... Lots of space, but I also have a second display for notes and uh, the Discord and all that. And, and you know, I, it's a 16-inch laptop. It's not tiny, but I still find it, you know, I, I find it to be very constrictive. Um, so, of course, I waited three weeks into this trip to finally fix it at the last second before the last show. So, that's the way I do things. Awesome time. Well, it's working, I think. Talk about it, and then I do it. It seems to be working great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't know why you bother joining together. Just having one machine that does the stream part and the other machine that does all your notes and things like that. Like, yeah, <laughs> that is the smartest thing I've ever heard. I, I, this is a. I am like I said, an idiot. I. Yeah, you're right. That would have worked fine. There was no reason to tie these two things together. I. I don't know what to tell you. I, I, <laughs> that that would have actually worked. If you get an idea fine. in your head, you just do it, and you don't think about yeah, it. You just really. do it. You just do it. Listen, I. <laughs> the simplicity and brilliance of that is so beautiful uh, yep that would have worked fine thanks yeah. thanks for yeah. you know you should have asked copilot it probably would it was have like a, a like a verbal kneecapping oh wow <laughs> like, you know the tanya harding of tech well deserved no no that's good <laughs> he's right 
Um, did <laughs> isn't this the day that Copilot was supposed to arrive for? Uh, it is all of us. Yeah, yeah. we're gonna get to that. Yeah, happy okay. day. Happy no, not day. for all of us. Uh, for the lucky, rich, and few of us in gigantic corporations, we're gonna get to this. How when, many seats of three sixty five do you have? Also, it depends on which uh, copilot you're talking about, because as you know, there are about 117 of them right now. Yeah. And um, like my you know, count, poking around at different teams, over 140. Here you go. No, I was joking, <laughs> but that, okay. You're kidding. But Sorry. Of, <laughs> nope. Oh it, you remember Sa Lord Satchel literally said, "Everybody <laughs> should go forth and make a copilot." And I mean, admittedly, most of these will never see the light of day, and that'll be a good thing. That's fine. But wow. They follow. They have followed the policy, and they're all experimenting. But that's like, yeah, I mean, uh, a from a, story. I don't know if it's genealogical perspective or just from a marketing perspective, uh, never the twain shall meet. Um, you know, Microsoft Copilot is considered, may or may not be really technically true, but kind of the base level of most of the, or many of the copilots, not all the copilots. Yeah. And so you see the same base capabilities across uh, Bing Chat, you know, the stuff that's integrated into Microsoft Edge, the, micro, uh, the Windows Copilot, as I'll keep calling it, because seriously, and uh, also Microsoft 365 Copilot, right? Yeah, I, I have to wonder if at some point these alters don't become APIs over top of a Microsoft Copilot. But yeah, exactly. Same yep. way that and, every product had to implement a PowerShell interface, but there was only one PowerShell. I think we're heading yeah, yeah. Right. Um, it's like only one XAML, you know, the dream. Oh, um, I, that's not true. There I, were, no, I, I, no, no. <laughs> well, um, I, I didn't want to get ahead of the, ahead of the, no, game. no, we it's can go I, back I, to 22, I, uh, H2. No, no, this is part, this is all part of it. There, there's okay. a, um, I don't know if this is technically true, but there are going to be, uh, extensions, I guess we'll call them or add-ons written to these co-pilots, uh, many of which will be common across the co-pilots, at least some subset of them. And if this thing was engineered correctly, and based on your comments about Lloyd Satch, I suspect that they weren't, they were thrown together rather hastily, then that same base layer should be where that extensibility model plugs in. And, um, you know, what you see depends on which copilot you're using, but I bet it doesn't work like that. So we we'll will find see. out. We'll see how they clean it up. Remember back in the day when, when Gates put out his internet tidal wave letter, mm -hmm. every team had to do something that was internet related, even SQL Server now, and right. to this day still has it. You can do a query that says as HTML, and That's it right. will put as, as a table. There was a shining moment of time where you could go into Word and save as HTML, Good. and uh, there was a little wizard you could publish it to a I don't know what you would use back then a blogger front page, a front page. There you go. Of course, front page. Yes. Well, um, I mean, the best thing about that HTML too is that you it was a great example of what not to do in HTML. <laughs> yep. So here is your well, cautionary tale. We call it Word Document. Yeah. So in the theme of what not to do, let's talk about 23H2. Um, <laughs> I'm going to try not to fly off the handle on this one. But uh, I, I I do have a little bit of a bat, back, pat, a back patting moment coming up here. Um, you may recall that in uh, September, Microsoft had that event. And uh, they announced a bunch of nothing, really. But one of the things they announced was that they were going to have the biggest Windows 11 update of all time was coming out uh, next week, the next week after the show, 150 right. new features. And uh, I looked around confusedly because all year long we've been testing that update. It was called Windows 11 version 23H2. What happened? You know, And we found out over time, thanks to uh, Zach Bowden at Windows Central, that they needed to get this stuff out early to force it on customers. Because if they put it in 23H2, some could just say no and wait till the next version. And that makes sense, uh, except what happened since then doesn't make any sense, just like the rest of this stupid year when it comes to Windows 11 updates. So one week later, they did ship that update that they promised, but it was a preview update, right? And um, two weeks later, Patch Tuesday came, and we thought, well, this is going to be the stable version. And nope, they just put out a normal monthly CU, nothing special. I don't think there were any new features or anything. It was nothing. It was bug fixes. And two weeks after that... They put out a second preview update, this one for October, that was exactly the same as the September preview update, except this time all of the new features were enabled by default. But still, this is not a release, right? A preview update is like a beta. It's a normal customers don't see it. Uh, you will not get it automatically. You have to go look and find it. Um, your organization could prevent you from getting it, of course. Um, my wife, any normal person, I use my wife as this example, would never even know it existed if I didn't babble about it endlessly for the past 35 days. But um, she never saw it, right? And then uh, last week, Microsoft contacted me and others and said, hey, guess what? Next week, 
we're going to release Windows 11 version 23H2, which at that time, our understanding of this thing was that it was kind of um, truncated because all the great new stuff already happened in that fall update that never really was released. And I kind of guessed, and I, I came to Mexico with the plan of updating the book for 23H2 as much as I could uh, while I was here and thinking I had until at least November, uh, November, late November, maybe, like the uh, before 23H2 would come out, maybe in preview form, right? Let alone final form. So this is, was just all off schedule. But the thing is, I, again, I want to go back to this September event. We talked to Mul Mary Jo and I and Chris Hoffman and others. We talked to multiple people from Microsoft trying to understand at that time what they were doing. And we got a hundred different answers. Um, and, and everyone, you know, we're looking to each other for something, some clarity, some idea, something, you know, what's happening. And I said, guys, this is just 23H2. Uh, they can call it whatever they want, but it's just 23H2. And, you know, Microsoft said, no, 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 the fall update, it's uh, blah, 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 whatever. Well, now that 23H2 is out, I want you to think about something here. They never released the fall update, right? Right. They released it in preview form. That is not releasing it, you know? Uh, that To this day, they have still not released that thing, but they have released 23H2, sort of. I actually, to be honest, I don't really see it anywhere, but it's it's out. They announced it's out, so it's it's out there. So I think that's kind of interesting. Um, and 23H2 will likely be the first and maybe only place where most of the population sees all of those new features, right? Copilot, the new Teams, um, Windows Backup app, et cetera, et cetera, whatever those things are. So I just think that's kind of, I for all of this screwing around with the schedule and the naming and what things are and what they aren't and blah, blah, blah. In the end, 23H2 just came out on Halloween, perfect. Nice. And I, you know, Okay, so here we are. It's the day after. I actually have never seen 23H2 on a stable PC or VM. And uh, of course, I went up to the Microsoft website to download the media creation tool and to see if I could just kind of force it that way. And I've done this now. I did this yesterday. I did it again today before the show on a uh, physical computer, by the way, not a VM. And uh, that thing still installs 22H2. God damn you, Microsoft. So I, I, it's kind of unbelievable. Um, I'll also point out there are these things you sort of forget about because they were two years ago and they never happened again, right? One was this notion of uh, blockers on the Windows 10 to Windows 11 upgrade. Microsoft said that they would put a, a what's called a safeguard hold on PCs that had maybe a hardware device or whatever it might be that was incompatible with Windows 11. And that over time, as those safeguard holds came out, uh, came out, yeah, as those safeguard holds were fixed, I guess is the best way to say it, uh, the locks would come off and those people could upgrade to Windows 11. That was two years ago, you know? And when I updated the book recently with that upgrade chapter, I was looking into this. I actually researched this. I couldn't find any examples of safe card holds still existing. And so I actually took that part of the book out. And then uh, they came out with their little blog post on Monday and said, hey, by the way, uh, if you're not getting it, you might have a safeguard hold. We still have those. And okay. <laughs> and apparently they have them between Windows 11 22H2 and Windows 11 20H3. Uh, 23H2, which should be impossible because it's the same code base. And I thought there were no compatibility issues this time. So great. <laughs> anyway, uh, the workaround as of this recording, and hopefully by the time you listen to this or by the time we reconvene next week, this will not be the case, is you can go to that same website. If you just Google download Windows 11, you'll go to the Microsoft site. There is something called the Windows 11 installation assistant. From the web, it will download an app. Uh, you can upgrade from Windows 11 to the new version of Windows 11. It's a little ponderous. You have to download the PC this Health Checker. From, this is different from the Windows 11 creation tool. Like, yeah. All right. I, so let, yeah, may, let me step I, through the three the three choices. Right. What? Download an ISO. Right. That's easy. Of course, you don't know what you're getting there. I even tried downloading the RAR ISO, but the, it's got to be 22H2 because the media installation tool, a uh, media creation tool, uses it. Right. Um, if you have that file, you can double click it, mount it, run setup. You could you could upgrade that way, assuming it was 23H2. I assumed it wasn't, so I went to uh, and I had done the second thing first, the the media creation tool. That's the wizard. You plug in a USB key, it not only downloads the ISO, but it plants it onto the USB key in bootable format. So you can use that. That's what I tried the first time. The third attempt, honestly, this is the most straightforward. It just takes a long time. Is uh, the Windows 11 installation assistant? This is a separate EXE. It runs a little wizard again. It actually requires you, and this is true on Windows 11 too, to run the PC Health Check app before it will proceed. 
that app, contrary to its name, has nothing to do with health. It has to do with making sure you meet the hardware requirements. Um, this is their soft right. block. And if you don't, you can't. Uh, and there were workarounds, obviously. I'm, nothing I have here is that problem, no problem. So uh, I use that. It took a long time, but it does it does upgrade the computer to 23H2. So you can, there's your workaround. Uh, what am I getting right here? This I'm on the Insider thing. I can't see it, but what does it say? It says, it says Windows, Windows Insider speed. Prefer 23580.1. Yeah. You have a new build from the Windows Insider program. That's all. We don't know what it is. It'll what be is the build number, though? Read, if you don't want to read that. 23580.1000. NI underscore pre-release. What are you on? What am what I? channel are you on? Is it, <laughs> don't is that tell me. Don't, the one you put me on. <laughs> no. Leo, I don't know. I don't know who you listen to. <laughs> don't to tell me. Windows, don't tell me that. Um, I, it's the release preview, I believe. Um, that shouldn't be a 23 number, though. Yeah. Um, uh, well, anyway, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to derail it. I was just no, curious. No, I'm, I was no, no, no. It's, uh, I was just uh, considering stop. I'm getting preview builds, right? I have 22.631. Okay. I have 23.580. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I don't care. Uh, I just I was okay. tar trying to help, <laughs> but obviously yeah, no, I, I did not help. <laughs> right. No, I know that feeling. I, <laughs> I'm just trying to help here. Um, so, uh, but so, but I think some percentage, of maybe a large, maybe the majority of our audience is probably on some insider ring. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things I, I don't want to transfer all of my PCs over to the kind of stable public release of twenty three H two quite yet, and it's for that reason because. I've been telling people, and again, it, it's it's hard with Microsoft these days because the old common knowledge is not, you know, they don't adhere to tradition, but the way it works, <laughs> the way it describes itself in the UI is that if you had signed up for the release preview, yeah, and, and then you went back into that interface and, um, I gotta put this thing back where it was. If you went back into that interface and um, said, look, I, I wanna make sure that this thing disenrolls when this version of Windows yes, is released. Yes, the window closing, it, as we've as we've it's, called it. It's kind of yeah, it's kind of a tough one because they don't really release things the same way anymore, right? right? And so, in other words, the version of Windows you that you're testing doesn't yeah. exist. There's no such thing. We're not testing a version of Windows. That should still it should still work. So I've been waiting to see if it happens. I was hoping in time for this show. It was a stupid desire on my part because it's only been one day, but I was hoping I would see on some computer that it had disenrolled from the Insider program. And that that has not happened. I got, so. uh, this is my fifth Insider preview in a month. <laughs> yeah, well, it right as you, it's been busy. It's been it's busy. Been busy, busy, um, busy. Because this yeah. has been, you know, happening. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. It's I, I, strange to get stranded in Insider builds where they're like, you got to pay to get to the full version too. Like they don't always give you a path out. Right, that's true. But release preview, right? I mean, that one there should be a path right out of there. Should be, should be a ride out. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, I, uh, years ago, Leo and I would have had a conversation where I, I sort of, well, no, I, where I sort of explained like how important it was for me as a not just for writing and what I do as a living, but for the books especially. Right. Well, you want to document something and say this is how you do it. Right. And it's gotten really squishy with the Windows stuff. I can't really say that a lot anymore. I, there are so many things now where I have to say, well, you may say this, you may say this. You know, it's it's become very difficult. So this uh, auto and uh, auto unenrollment from the release preview is on that list. I'm, I'm I want to make sure that still works because honestly, I've been able to say that kind of thing. But as they screwed around with the Insider program over the past year or two, it's become untrue of certain channels. And um, I, I mean, release preview. It should always be tied to a version of Windows. It's the one that should. Yeah. And uh, we'll see. You know, we're looking for evidence there. Well, yeah. as soon as so, it's done, I'll tell you what version I'm on. Yeah. See what it says. Okay. Yeah. I, it's 23 numbers confusing to me, but I guess we'll see. Actually, this computer was a release preview. That might be why I'm seeing a different version number. I don't. Um, I don't want to. Hmm. The computer on my left, I'm using as a display, is actually the one I did the clean install on. I should look at the build number over there. Yeah, let me do a Windows X and uh Yeah, we'll do a Windows R and just type Winver. Oh, I could that's the, the easy that's way. the easy way, huh? Yeah, well it's already even written for me before two two H two. So I'm a year yeah. behind. I'm last. Yeah, see year. well I'll see what happens. And you're you've got that button clicked for um get updates as soon as possible, obviously. Uh yeah, something happened. All right, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Yep. 
Um, I, I, last night, I, I was writing an article uh, because someone from Microsoft had documented a new community feature that's in the free version of Teams that's part of Windows 11. And in reading it, I realized I need to write an editorial about this, not an article about what happened, because nobody cares about this app. No one's ever going to use it. But Microsoft has now referred to the free version of Teams by my count by five different names. Um, they made it seem in September like this was going to be a brand new app and it was going to behave completely differently. And it is the same app and it behaves almost identically. It's just that in it, it's not an item pinned to the taskbar by default. It's just a shortcut, a normal app shortcut now. And Copilot has taken its place in that little special list of uh, item icons, for lack of a better term. Um, I went to their website last night. I went. To, I looked back at their press releases and blog posts, and um, what I found was the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life, which is this: Microsoft has multiple versions of Teams, and uh, if you're using the commercial version of Teams, which I think we would all agree is the real version of Teams, like Teams, right. actual Teams, um, you and you teams. look at yeah, Teams, just like literally Teams, Teams, the, and the, not yeah. The name of that app in Windows is uh, Microsoft Teams Work or School. <laughs> it's not Teams. The app that is named Teams in Windows is the one that comes with Windows, the ones no, the one no one's ever going to use. And uh, if you've upgraded to the new version of Teams, so you could have your classic version of Teams and your new version of Teams, the consumer version of Teams. Um, it's uh, it's hilarious. And so I like, I like that the Teams team has followed Windows 11 down this uh, lack of clarity sinkhole. Uh, so that's been kind of fun. I just... I just... I, I wrote like a thousand words about this last night. I'm not going to bore everyone with it here, but... Um, that's part of Windows 11, uh, 23 is two. In fact, it's one of the sort of new features that, um, depending on how you got it earlier, if you did may or may not have rolled out to your PC, but it will now. So you'll get that. Um, there's not much else that's new in 23 H2 that you couldn't have gotten. Um, I'd say over the last month, I guess, since the end of September. So it's out supposedly, <laughs> I don't know. Um, and do we miss chat? Yeah. Are we sad that chat is now? No, well, no you know, more? here here's the the irony of chat, which was that item, right? So chat was a front end to the consumer version of Microsoft Teams, right? And um, which no one uses and no one should use. It's silly, except for one thing. Actually, the consumer version of Teams is pretty nice. It's a kind of a clean, lightweight version of Teams. Um, I think the name throws people off. They think it's not for families and friends and things. Yep. Um, they had Skype. I, was that brand not excellent or something? I don't know what they're call doing it, there. But call it Squad. Yeah, I'll call it Skype Pro or something. Skype I don't Pro. know. But um, so chat was a front. So this goes back to the pandemic. Remember, in twenty, it would have been twenty twenty, the end of twenty twenty, Microsoft introduced a feature to Windows ten, which was current at that time, called Meet Now, and Meet Now was a response to both the pandemic and also to con uh, competitors like Zoom that were opening up everything for free to everybody, right? And so with Meet Now, you could click on this little icon in the, in the near the tray there, and a little panel would pop up. And you could start a text, audio, or video chat with anyone in the world. They didn't even have to have Skype. It would just work with anyone. All you needed was some way to reach them, email or a, a text message, whatever, or a, not an email, an email or a, not a text message, I'm sorry, email or, or so you could send them a link or whatever it was. And uh, they didn't have to have a, a Skype account. They didn't have to have a Microsoft account. Uh, they, I don't remember the numbers anymore, but I think it was 30 hours of free chat, you know, video chats a month or something. You know, they were responding to the pandemic. It was nice. Yeah. And um, when Windows 11 came around, of course, by that point, Teams is huge, and they're trying to bank on that. And that's when the consumer version of Teams came up. And chat was the consumer Teams version of Meet Now. Right. Same thing. Right. You didn't have to have an account, a simple little UI, let you do it, the free calling, everything. It was, you know, it's honestly a nice little feature. Um, so in 23H2, as we get rid of chat, that item icon that was in the taskbar, and we replace that with Copilot, um, we just have a standard uh, Teams consumer, as I'll call it, uh, icon shortcut sitting there. Interestingly, it offers two modes, right? You can, it, there's a mini mode which is the default and it looks like chat. It's a cute little front end to the rest of the app. And if you need more than that, you can click a little button up in the um, title bar and it switches in. Well, it doesn't switch actually, it was a different window, but you can switch into the normal app mode. So you can go back and forth between the two modes if you want. So it's honestly, it's kind of the same thing. It's just, um, it's just not a weird hard coded um, item that's pinned to the taskbar by default anymore. I think Copilot is more important now, so. Huh. 
Hope that makes sense. Um, mm-hmm. If it doesn't, don't worry about it. Right click and uninstall it because no one's ever going to use it. Who cares? Uh, uh, and that was always the problem, right? It's like, yeah. this is a great app, except for nobody using it. So I can't talk to anybody. I know. Exactly. And like, I need another messaging app, you know, well, for it's, starters, it's right? much too late now. The time to get this right was 20, was March of yeah. 20. Yep. They should have. This could have been Zoom. I, right. I, they should have kept it as Skype. I think Skype was a good brand. I think it still is. And they could have called it, you know, like they did with uh, Windows 2000, Skype powered by Microsoft Teams, yeah. you know, even if it wasn't true. It and would, just, have been, would have been much clearer. Yeah. You know, and the, and the reality of this is straight political. Like, yeah, look, I know it's wrong with that technology. It's, it's yeah. almost like if you're Some, on the Skype team, you must have made somebody angry. Yeah. Sometimes the branding or the positioning works. Yeah. Teams is tough because its name invokes a work-related, you know, team situation, right? I mean, yeah. I, and it's no, just... You're exactly right. And it's, it's like, it, it's okay. You know, there's okay. nothing wrong with, yeah, this is the work stuff. Here's the consumer stuff. The fact that right. you keep trying to tie them together just hurts both. Yep. It's too bad. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's too bad. Uh, yeah, it's just back too bad. in the day with the podcasting, we did a lot via Skype. And, and that was the, it was the path of least resistance. And then eventually over time, he's, I'm saying to a, a guest, Hey, just, I'll connect with you on Skype. And they're like, what's Skype? Like, what? yeah, <laughs> wow. Right. I know. Well, That's yeah, all so we used for 15 years. Yeah. Sky, I haven't Sky. started that app in a year. Let me update it. Right? Yeah. Like, Skype exactly. usage. Right. Like I bet next. it parallels like the people who still get print newspapers. Like they're just kind of old and they're not changing anything. <laughs> you well, know, like they're, they're just, I don't Every know. so often you open Skype again, like you should do that. Well, you <laughs> know, actually, I, I, see I, use there. It, I well, still use it regularly. And it's been heavily exploited too. So you'll be yes. saturated in all kinds of nastiness, uh-huh. right? Like, Co- co-pilots in there. You can uh, chat with a bot if you want. Honestly, it's not a bad app. No. Um, if, if a team gave it some love and cleaned it up, it really yeah. could be a great consumer product. I. Yep. And, I, you, and everybody already has it. Right, like you, you have an account somewhere. Well, unless you get a new computer with Windows 11, right? Because this is the first one that doesn't come with it built in, which is so stupid. I get an email once a year from Skype reminding me that I have Skype credit. Yes, I know, and that's the time you use it, and then your Skype credit is good for another year. Yeah, I send a text message to myself (laughs) saying, "This is sad," and then. (laughs) I present. I preserve my twelve dollars and fifty seven cents. That's funny. I do exactly the same thing, oh, except that I also I do use Skype. I just don't use that. That was when you could the, the credit is so you could call phone numbers, right? Right. Exactly. Um, yeah. No, I still have a couple of friends who use Skype, so I keep it around. But they've been those people have been dropping off. There was a guy who I hadn't heard from in a few months, and he finally <laughs> contacted me, and he's like, "How do you how do you feel about Instagram messaging?" And I'm like, "I, I sure, who cares." Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it very much with certain, I'm, um, you know, trying to phase out certain messages. Like, what else do you use? Let me find you there. Let's yeah. find the matrix yeah, of those please, messaging apps. Don't go to Instagram messaging, please. Yeah. No, I, I know. I just, I'm why just, would that's what anybody? That. Although you live on Instagram, so maybe it's good for you. You post I, a so lot on Instagram. I don't, but I don't actually use Instagram messaging. And so what yeah. happens is every once in a while, there. just like this, yeah. Well, the Skype credit thing he was talking about. I'll, I'll see the little notification thing and i'll look at it and it'll be like boop, 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 boop. I'm like oh boy like i don't i don't think of instagram as a messaging app i guess uh, yeah yeah i think of it as an ad delivery app with occasional photos <laughs> exactly um, <laughs> exactly you know i uh, yeah. a couple of weeks ago rejoined facebook uh mostly because i wanted yes, to kind of see what that. was going on uh i alerted with, you when i saw that i thought I know, you were being was, scammed no or i know i scared yeah, a lot of people a hack. And, yeah, and what I yeah. and I did when I my first post was link back to Mastodon so you can see that's me on the Twit Social and you know I can right. verify it. But uh, it was mostly just to see what's going on with this information as we lead up to the election and during the Israeli Hamas war. Yeah, um, sure. and it is it is it is actually much worse <laughs> than I thought. It was. Yeah, no, I, I, it's I, gone I use it way day. downhill. I, I hate what it's become. And I listen, I, Meta is. Horrible and they're evil, but Threads uh, isn't I, bad, ironically. But uh, Threads is the, that's what I was going to say. Threads is not bad, but here's the problem. Well, there's two problems. There's no API, so I can't post to Threads automatically yeah, from right. my site when I publish articles. No. And I would do that right now. I'd, I'd be willing yep. to make that transition right now. I know it's coming, but it's not there yet. But the other one, and this is uh, this is inexcusable. There are Threads blocks built into my Instagram feed, and I think now on, in- oh, yes. now on Facebook too, yes, they put that you Instagram. cannot say no to. Uh-huh. I am yeah. not an Instagram to read text. Yeah, I'm. I am there to see photos. That is inexcusable. 
Well, and Instagram I, I, has I know. ads every three pictures now. I mean, it's... I know. Every three? It's, I think it's worse than that. Let's see, maybe even but more. I, yeah. yeah. It looks like it's, it's every awful. other picture, actually. I don't no, no. ever want to see anything sponsored. I don't care about basketball dunk contests or dogs being funny or whatever nonsense is in there. And I certainly... And the ads are just... Dear God, stop. Yeah, it's all, it's awful. It sure feels like, you know, the apocalypse has certainly hit us in podcasting. The sponsorship is harder and harder, but I think it's hitting everything. Yeah. Like all of us no, are, think, are struggling. Yeah. No, I had this conversation with the, the guys who do our newsletter about the website, like the uh, web ads uh, stuff has gone down the tubes the past couple of months. And you know what I, I really think just, is it's all gone to Facebook and Google. Now, I think 90% yeah. has gone to Google, actually. Um, right. So maybe I'm, I'm I'm complaining about the wrong thing. Maybe what I should be doing is hailing our uh, Facebook overlords yes. and embracing them more and They're bringing in them into my life. They're now in charge. And incidentally, if yeah. you'd like a little box you can blow up your tires with, I got one right here on Instagram. <laughs> like, what, is it Tiny Tim? It's like, uh, thank you, sir. Oh, I have minute. another. Yeah, it, um, it's, it's, it, it is. It's every other picture or every yeah, I think third so, picture. Right? It's it's crazy. I also, I, I, the other, this didn't happen today. I think yesterday or the day before I, I opened it first thing in the morning and it said right at the top of the feed, you have already seen all of your new posts. Here's some, here's some here's other some stuff. And I'm like, no, I haven't. I just woke <laughs> <Yeah>. up. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> we wouldn't want you to be postless. So here. Yeah, yeah, here's some, you, here's haven't, some you haven't looked at 12 hours and there's yeah. no posts to look at. They could just say, yeah, nobody loves you. It's That's actually, <laughs> and I almost hate to admit this, but it, it's brought home how much I miss Twitter. Because you could actually go to Twitter. If you yes. were in the, you know, you needed a hit. Yes. A little yep. dopamine fix. I love, well, okay. You could go to Twitter. Let me make it a little more uh, business centric. I would say from my perspective, before the Elon Musk thing, people would complain about Twitter sometimes. They would talk about the toxicity. They would talk about... Yeah. Famous people getting on there and spreading to, misinformation. To, to which also. Elon said, hold my beer. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, <laughs> so, and my, ex, my, ex, my experience at that time was nothing like that. I, in my own little world on Twitter, in whatever little group I'm, I was in, I found Twitter to be very useful as a direct way to communicate with two people who maybe watch this podcast or read what I write and, or who were my, uh, you know, colleagues in the industry or whatever it was. And I never saw any of that stuff ever. It wasn't until Elon Musk took over that this thing started going. We can't link to Twitter from my website anymore. We used to have a Twitter feed on the side. Um, it's gotten really bad. And now I see I, a lot of Twitter is horrible now. And yeah. it was not like that before. So I, I, this is not so much the introduction of terribleness as it is the loosening of controls that prevented that terribleness before is how I view yeah. it. Turns out the old Twitter was doing stuff that was useful. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And now there's right. really nothing. I mean, it's just everything has gone to hell. I yeah. guess I'm sounding like an old man, but uh, you know, but, believe what but do you at least do now when you speech. wake up at they three in the morning? Now, so, and you you wake up at three in the morning and you're just looking for a little dopamine to get back to sleep. Yeah. Well, I go to I go to Truth Social. That's what I do. But, there you, you know, go. I think it depends. Maybe I should try that. <laughs> Uh, somebody's boy. posting in real time <laughs> right about then right. too ironically right. yeah right. all right exactly um okay we got off track there what else? but that's okay you you still uh, just you, a few you did the iso and you got 22h2 we should mention that although yeah. i know uh sorry i should say i did not explicitly download the iso i oh, okay. downloaded the media creation tool which downloaded the iso and it got 22h2 it's possible and by the way like i said by the time you hear this or next week it's it's going to switch over eventually. Right. I mean, even Microsoft will figure that one out. One of our uh, Discorders um, said she got twenty two H three. I thought so too. Yeah. So I don't. I can't. I don't want to say that that's not the case. I just haven't tried it um, explicitly. So yeah. that's that's one of the three ways to do it. Sarah Sarah says uh, she got, and she's yeah, she even so good. put put up the proof installed on ten thirty one. Twenty. We're good because she's a liar. No, that's good. <laughs> um, <laughs> we believe that you, screenshot was edited. We I use believe Photoshop. you. Yeah. No, that's good. Good. That's good. I mean, it's going to happen eventually if it hasn't happened already. Yeah. So it yeah. will happen uh, across the board. Okay. So uh, just some insider stuff. Uh, Microsoft is killing the Windows Insider MVP program, which I think, of course, triggers the natural question. There was an MVP program for the Windows Insider program? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I mean, like, what, what, what exactly do you do to qualify to that? Like, I, I, you know, you... You install a lot of builds or something? What do you, that doesn't even make sense. So uh, I... Look, personally, I don't feel that 
uh, Microsoft and, the, and nobody, and it's like nobody's program. losing their MVP. They're being shifted to other categories. Okay, there you go. I mean, I mean, here's the joke, right? An MVP, the MVP program is really built around an ind individual products in the sense that right. somebody's relationship with the product means that they engage so copiously inside of the mm -hmm. community that Microsoft awards them something. Right. right. When you actually look at the MVP categories, like if you go to now the other direction, so you understand you become an MVP because you engage with a product, you share it in a community, and you get an award. But then you're told you're in a category, and those categories have nothing to do with the product per se they, they're sort yeah. of generalized groupings that's right i would argue even admitting there was a windows M insider mvp program kind of breaks that concept because really they weren't called that they were in a different grouping so yep uh, you, you may have just actually revealed a budget line item oh i think you might be right actually because it is a cost center Every uh, and it's a, yep. you know sort of the reality of this is all these product teams spend a certain amount of money to support right. a certain number of MVPs and so I think That's they right. may have pulled that around and so I, you know I, you know, I don't I, even know why you say it things have changed so much you know back in the day Microsoft had RDP and TAP programs for corporate customers which was a way to get them inside early products early on yeah. uh, uh, new products early on and new versions early on and, and test things out make changes based on feedback. You know, the MVP program was sort of like is sort of like that for individuals. These are for people who are either enthusiasts or industry uh, insiders who, you know, maybe uh, implement SharePoint and thus are a SharePoint MVP because they're super useful in that community. They help right. other people with their problems and so forth. They write a great blog or they make a podcast. Right. Or something. It's, it's it sounds good on the surface. Unfortunately, um, you know, the MVP program also has that kind of dark side where it's, it is kind of about freebies and insider access and these little briefings you have from time to time. And they have an MVP uh, summit every year in Redmond um, still to this day, right, which is a big deal, you know. Um, uh, you, have, you, know, you have to pay to go, I guess, but it's kind of a fun thing to do to get together with uh, your fellow nerds. Um, but it, it, it's always kind of rubbed me the wrong way, and I, this has never been a popular opinion. Um, I don't, I, I've never, I, I've, it's always kind of bothered me. I, I, Is this because you're not an MVP, Paul? Is that what we're really talking about? <laughs> I was an MVP, and I left uh, for uh, ethical reasons. Um, Oh. One was that I ran into issues where they would have briefings about coming products, which I did not attend, but yep. people would suspect I did secretly, you know, oh, yeah, to learn yeah. about stuff. And also no, no, the, you... the free gifts from Microsoft stuff. I can't, I can't take gifts, you know, like, I, and it just didn't wow, make sense. Paul, you're like so old fashioned. I, very well, okay. me, I, I think, think I have this, uh, the word you're looking for is credible. Credible, yeah, uh, yeah. integrity, <laughs> honest. I know, it, you know. I mean, one would argue you can't sign the MVP NDA and do your job. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's right. correct. That's right. That, yeah, that would be correct. a reasonable, reasonable yeah. statement. And I'm, yep. I've been an MVP now coming on 20 years. Right. And, you know, it's an interesting line to, to run along. I do turn a blind eye to things I could see for exactly that reason. There are times and when you, you can only talk when you don't know. Not that. You need me to say this, I guess, but I've known you for many years and you've never, you don't violate any NDAs or anything like that ever. Like you're very. You're an uh, MVP because you that's your business, right? I mean, is that. Yeah. Well, well because I've been a community person for a really long time. Yeah. For yeah. better. This is. Yep. This is yeah. I mean, it, your identity. It, it's sort of a. You know, back, back in the day, it would have been people on Outlook News, as I think we used to call it, or whatever that was called, in news groups. Right. Uh, oh, yeah. Actually, before that, it would have been. The original MVPs were on CompuServe. Exactly. Right. I'm sorry. Yeah, wow. Um, you know, back you go the, back to um, that to that yep. those days. Yeah. Wow. That, because that was the community. You were in there helping other people. The yeah, products, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, these days, it's on public news groups. It's on blogs. It's yeah, I see that. I even go to the Microsoft support pages, and it's, it'll say, you know, MVP yes. or MVP Gold or yeah. whatever. Right. That's where they hang out. They'll hang out on yeah. techcommunity.microsoft.com or whatever. And those um, are people and, you can trust. They don't work for Microsoft, but they have. Uh, I was like, oh, you said so many things wrong there. I know they're not people <laughs> I can trust. Um, they are people. That part was great. Um, they are MVPs. Most valuable professionals. Yeah, yeah. The, the everybody tech... comes with you know some baggage of yeah. how they look at them. right. That's right. There, the, look, I the one uh, uh, this is semi related to this or very related to this. I've often tried to explain to various groups at Microsoft. Um, if you just brief me about something, I can't write about it until you say it's okay. Right. But if you yeah. don't, I can and I do. And um, you know, if you don't want me, well, not divulging something at a time. Brief me. 
tell me on the record. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then it's over. Well, and, the, and the joke, you know? of course, is that your speculation, because you've been doing it longer than most of those folks, right, is pretty accurate just because you know how things go down. Yeah. Well, so, it wasn't until this year, Richard. That's the problem. See, I <laughs> this year has been... Uh, you know, the roulette wheel, like, let's see what, you know, uh, yeah, the old called 23 H two. Right. That this is, this year has been a, I'm going to be in therapy for years because of 23. Uh, I kind of like not being, uh, not, not being so sure. So I, mean, I said this. I, to, okay. I, I, I'm okay. pretty sure that I was right about there's multiple teams working here. They're not necessarily speaking to each other and that's, what's making this blurry. Right. I, but okay, and you I, saw that paper come out, and that was okay. Dad showed up and told us all we had to play nice to each other, and so yeah. that's what it's going to be. Oh, I, oh, with the co-pilots, yes. I, uh, the, well, not just co-pilots, also with the insider release. You think so? Oh, okay, yes. But with the Windows 11 update schedule and the kind of cadence of all that, I man, I don't know what's going on. Mm. But I, you know, I what? My, Would you if you were an MVP? To? No. <laughs> okay, so there you go. So you think those people have more clarity than we do? <laughs> no way. Well, and, and it, I mean, in, once upon a time, you got insider briefings and things, but these days yeah. with so much of it being done in open source anyway, it's like, oh, listen, you want to read good. the thing? It's on GitHub. Just read the code. Yeah. Published every week. Or read the, the readme or whatever. Yeah. Um, the, the only thing in the history of Windows that is even sort of close to this, probably, was Windows 8. Uh, Windows 8 was so insane. It made no sense. And there are, every time you ask questions, like the 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 sort of flat face answer you got, where it's like, uh, you know, you could tell they had no idea. They were winging it. You know, you could just tell. And um, there was a point there as Windows 8 was kind of colliding down that path. It was just going to happen. It was too late to stop it. Where I just sort of thought, you know what? I'm just going to enjoy the carnival ride for what it is. This is the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. But let's just have fun with it, you know? And I, I'm having trouble with doing that now. <laughs> I just love it. I don't know if it's because I'm older or whatever, but I just feel like I, there's some good stuff going on here. I mean, I wish they would uh, communicate clearly and provide some clarity on the schedule, especially for businesses. And I, I just don't see that. I don't quite, I don't understand it. I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's, it's strange. I do think you're struggling. I think, you know, team focus has shifted. Yeah. They, there's been a number of, uh, you know, Windows 10 was the proving ground of what does yeah. Windows look like when it's not the center of the company? How do we move forward? And they've tried a bunch of things. Some of them gone better than others. Right. Uh, 11 is its own weird, you know, story all by itself. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, yeah. bit, a bit we're getting I, around I, to a new future. It, I, yeah. I feel Paul's pain because I think Paul considers it his a solemn duty. This is his job is to explain yeah, what the hell's going I, on. I, yeah, I mean, and I, I'd like to be able to accurately, you know, yeah. but I look, I, I don't want to lose track of the fact that there are some good things happening, you know, for all of the weirdness around updating windows uh, that also came, that was the proving ground windows 10. And, um, they made a lot of mistakes with windows as a service, but on the other end of it, you know, guess what? They can update this operating system at the drop of a hat. If they have to, they have so many ways to uh, update almost any component of windows when and where they need to. Um, that stuff has actually gotten a lot more reliable. It's, it is better. They do it too much. You know, they're a little spastic about it. Yeah. I just got um, five insider updates this month. Yep. But they, but uh, the process has gotten better. So they did prove that out in windows 10. That's good. And also uh, just from the perspective of someone who cares about windows more than anything else at Microsoft, um, this AI thing, I love that it has lifted the windows boat along with the rest of the company because windows was kind of being left by the wayside on a lot of stuff. No, no, and, we're uh, definitely in a path where it's not like another operating system becoming more relevant. Operating systems are on their way to becoming irrelevant. Yeah. The same way that microcode in CPUs is irrelevant or BIOS is irrelevant. How dare you? I mean, no, you're right. Plunk. Yeah. That's yeah, why I, I use Linux because it's irrelevant. <laughs> Because, Let me take you know, a uh, little break. Out of the box, already irrelevant. <laughs> <I'll> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> when we come back, a yeah, yeah, it's irrelevant. <laughs> So it's use what you want. Please. Use what you want. Okay, please uh, go to our Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> we, we're going to take a little break. Come back. There is the Insider Program does have some updates. In fact, I'm in the middle of one right now. We'll talk about that yeah. when we continue. But first, a word from our sponsor, Nureva. Nureva Meeting Room Audio Technology. And, it, you know, you've heard me talk about it. For some time now, it really has a history of wowing IT professionals, like uh, at Duquesne. Duquesne University has, this is kind of amazing, 100, 100 Nureva devices installed. 
you know, I imagine they tried one. They said, wow, this is great. We have lots of lecture halls, lots of meeting rooms. Let's put them everywhere. One of Duquesne's senior technologists said, quote, I cannot say enough about how impressed I am. Audio has been my life's work for 30 years, and I'm amazed at what a Nareva mic and speaker bar will do. Nareva is easy to install. If you can install a, saw, a, install a sound bar, you can install a Nareva sound speaker and microphone. Nareva's patented microphone mist technology puts a thousand microphones in the room. So everybody everywhere in the room can be heard clearly no matter where they're facing. This is so important for your huddle room, your, your, your all hands room, your lecture hall, because you've got people who are not in person anymore, right? They're at home. And, they, and they're on a conference call, and, you know, bad audio just kills it. Nareva solves it. Nareva just made another leap forward with the introduction of their Pro Series, featuring the HDL310, that's for large rooms, and the HDL410 for extra large rooms. For the first time, you can get Pro Audio performance and plug-and-play simplicity in the same system. You know, in the old days, multi-component pro AV systems were the only way to do this at great expense, highly technical. You had to have technicians to tune it. It was just tough to get performance in large and extra large rooms. This is suddenly, it's very, very easy. Just try the online demo. You, you On the online demo, the, you'll hear the Nareva expert being heard, and he, he gets under a table, behind a pillar. Uh, it doesn't matter what the obstructions are. It doesn't matter where uh, the, the speaker is facing. The HDL 410, that's that's for the big rooms, covers 35 by 55, 35 feet by 55 feet. And it's just two mics and speaker bars. And one of the cool things is you if, if it's a divisible room, you know, you've got the divider open, you got the two, but you close it, it automatic it senses that and it can automatically now be two independent systems. That's super cool. The HDL 410 also features a unified coverage map which processes mic pickup from the two devices at the same time. So when they're unified, it creates a giant single mic array. Close the divider, now you got two. It's really, really smart. The HDL310, that's still pretty big, 30 feet by 30 feet. And that's just one mic and speaker bar for 900 square feet. Nareva is all about simplicity. The HDL310 takes about 30 minutes to install. With two of them, the 410 takes twice that, 60 minutes. 60 minutes. And and calibration, forget it. It's continuous. It's automatic. It continuously adapts to changes. Close the divider, it knows. It the, Put up tables, chairs. It knows. Fill it with 1,000 people or just five. It knows. And with the Nareva console, which is their cloud-based management platform, you can do it all without leaving your seat. IT loves this. They don't have to go to each room and calibrate it. And say, you can update firmware. You can check device status. You can change settings all from the console, wherever you are. Bottom line, with the Pro Series, Nureva makes it simple to quickly and cost-effectively equip more of your spaces for remote collaboration. It's The, the time has come to, to take a look at Nureva. N-U-R-E-V-A. Nureva.com slash twit. T-W-I-T. Nureva. Pro AV performance and plug and play simplicity together at last. Nareva.com slash twit. We thank him so much for supporting Windows Weekly and uh, the mighty and the confused. Paul Therott. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, speaking of confused, I thought I muted myself when I left, but I didn't. Um, sorry, I, I have a button here. Yeah, I can yeah, press it and there's no try sound. To, no, I didn't even try to. I didn't know. I didn't hear it because I, oh, I, I muted you right away. Yeah, I've worked at home for 30 years. I, I talk to myself a lot. As soon um, as I saw you get up, yeah, my finger you know. reaches over here, see this button, boom, and you're silent. Okay. Yeah. I usually mute when I leave. And I, That's fine. I, don't know, I like have something. the power. He has yeah. so much power. I have so much power. So uh, I'm getting in my insider bill. Boy, this is taking forever, by the so, way. Yeah, so I, uh, during the ad, I checked uh, the Windows Insider blog, and they're I, expecting maybe there was a new... Uh, bill today there wasn't for the release preview um but there was for canary and uh, oh, that's weird Dev, i believe well this might be an old i might not have although it says i got one on the 29th so, so i don't it's not that yeah, old it, there have been a lot lately that 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 is true um but this uh the release notes for the canary build has an interesting thing in here 
Um, starting with this build, the maps and movies and TV apps will no longer be installed by default when using a clean install. And I don't know if that means they're being deprecated in the future or uh, going away entirely. Uh, I think we can all agree Windows Maps has sort of outlived its usefulness now that we don't have phones, right? Uh, the idea before was you could start doing a directions a lookup on your PC and send it to your phone. It was kind of a cool idea. Um, Movies and TV is their app for DRM protected content uh, through, that you buy through the Microsoft Store and or get through uh, Movies Anywhere, that service where you can link all your services. Uh, perhaps they're going to add that functionality to the new media player app. Um, it is an old school, almost Windows 8 looking app. Well, that's not fair. It's probably a Windows 10 looking app, I guess. But it's uh, it looks out of place in Windows 11 for sure. So I wonder if that means they're getting rid of it. I didn't mm. know. Yep. It's the first I've heard of anything like that. Um, also, since we're on that build, uh, they had announced this earlier, possibly because they put it in a different channel. But um, during the out-of-box experience of Windows setup, so you buy a new PC, you open up that white screen comes, the blue you know, Windows logo, it tells you you have to sign into an account, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you have to be connected to a network for that to work. <laughs> um, and if you, this wouldn't happen on a new PC, I guess, but if you built your own PC, perhaps, or if you were rolling out, uh, well, you wouldn't go through the OOB. Actually, I guess it's only for white box guys. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, it's going to give you an option to install drivers during setup so you can get online. Um, eliminating that complaint. Um, if you do have the Windows 11 field guide, I, and I remember this only because I just updated this chapter, there are ways around that stuff. You don't have to be connected to the internet to install Windows 11, but we'll have to test in the future if that's going to change. I can't imagine they'll completely get rid of it, but that is kind of interesting. Uh, and then on the dev channel build, not much there. Uh, da -ka -da -ka -da. They're going to let local accounts access Copilot and Windows for a limited number of queries. That's kind of interesting. Um, I just wrote about Copilot for the book, and I have to say there's a lot of a Microsoft account integration there. Um, if you use it to create an image, for example, it saves it to um, the Bing image creator backend, which is tied to your Microsoft account, so you can always access it from the web. So it, I could see it being less useful with a local account. And that's about it. Not too much else. So the two builds today are not profound, and even less profound were the two we got last week. Uh, um, they're adding a recently added folder to the top half of the start menu for new apps. Um, hmm. Typically, those have been in recommended, not in a folder, but you know they're screwing around with it, I guess. Uh, that's in the dev channel, not a big deal. And then the beta channel build from last Thursday were two new features we've seen elsewhere, which is that system component thing I've been talking about, uh, new interface and settings, and then the game bar uh, rebranding used to be Xbox game bar. Actually, I think if you're in 23H2, yeah, it's already, it's called game bar. So there you go. They, we've already done that. So obviously they're testing it in the side of production. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> and then because it is November 1st, as we record this, we looked at stat counter today. They're the only, uh, analysts, I don't know, uh, market, what do we call these people? Market researchers, whatever mm -hmm. left standing for this kind of information. Um, windows 11 actually saw a little bump in the past month. It's been pretty flat this year, but now windows 11 is about 26% of all windows versions. Um, it's almost entirely consumer. Yeah, I do. I do. I think yeah, it's I just the enterprise folks have no interest, like not a thing. Yep. I, yeah. And actually, that's an interesting way to look at it because <laughs> these numbers match the way I look at Microsoft's revenues, consumer versus commercial, uh, one yeah. to three, right? So uh, Windows 10 still accounts for almost 70% of all Windows usage uh, compared to 26% for Windows 11. If we do a little math, and these, this is not accurate, I don't want anyone to hold me to this, but because this does not translate exactly, but if there are 1.4 billion Windows users overall, that means it's just under a billion still on Windows 10, about 970 million, and about 366 million on um, Windows 11. So three to one, roughly, right? That's and it's, you know, and it's, gotta say, it, it's on that. Go ahead. It's your thought that it's business people primarily that are uh, not no, moving uh, over, not right? Moving. Yeah. No, the, yep. and that's definitely the, in the energy. Uh, is yeah. uh, there's yeah. no reason to move off of 10. 11 doesn't bring anything. It breaks a bunch of things like the group policy is not symmetrical, although it's close now, right. like the only now in the, and maybe 23 H2 will be the one where for an enterprise person, it's like, okay, this is yeah. not a big deal to make a shift other than the training overhead for the stuff that's moved around. I think, yeah. I think they have uh, addressed enough of the concerns yeah. that that can start happening. 
Yeah. And that was just you know. like, and, and that's why they were, they were at, they've been after that for a year with the, mm-hmm. Hey, 2025 is it for 10, which nobody believes at least in on the internet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, by the way, uh, I don't, we don't talk about this too much, but every once in a while, Microsoft does add something to Windows 10. Yes. Um, I, I guess we could technically say it's it's not really a feature, but um, but they add little things, right? The start menu changes a little bit. They add things to the taskbar sometimes. It's. Um, Do you understand it, how happy the enterprise is with the operating system not changing? Because yes, we got other stuff to do. Like yep. this is not important. So even as an individual, and I, I considered just maybe I should just use Windows 10, you know, yeah. um, but as a person and, and not just because I have to know what's happening in Windows 11, et cetera. But uh, I find Windows 11 to be kind of antiquated from a UI perspective. Um, that 10. thing. Yeah, it's, it seemed fresh. Uh, Windows 10, sorry. It seemed fresh, you know, at the time. And but it's it, you can tell looking at it now, it's like this is phone. They made this look like phone, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, no, no, that, and, I, and I've keeping one workstation on 10, moved another one to 11. Like I'm definitely trying to live in the mix, but I'm yeah. on, plus I'm de corporatizing the all of my machines now as I li- become right. an M5 fanboy. I got to say <laughs> um, that article and, they, and that the, the piece you were talking about, about the market share piece, the biggest okay. in that whole thing is Mac OS going from 15 percent to 20 percent. In a year, yeah, yep, that's a huge number. Yeah, right, because the 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 gain of Windows 11 roughly matches the the decline of Windows 10. Although, by the way, Windows yeah. 10, 10 over a year, pretty solid, right? 71 percent yeah. to sixty nine percent. That was yeah. all it dropped in one year. This this is a conversation we're going to have a lot this about Microsoft cost, extending, to right? To enterprise, but enterprise. you're right. Uh, yeah, comparing it to the alternative OS, alternative OS is yeah, uh, yeah. This is. And I think I talked about this last week, you know, Windows 11 was a response to Microsoft's fear of this happening, that the combination of Apple Silicon and all the the performance and battery life gains there, yeah, and the kind of device-like nature of it, taking away the complexity of the horribleness of the PC and the yep. fan noise and all that stuff, is a serious competitive threat to them. They Since the M series started, they've simply been the, if you have a choice of computer, this is what you buy. Yeah. The, especially the Air variants are reasonably priced. Right. Uh, unbelievable performance, stunning battery life. Like right. if you are open to choice, why would you consider anything else? Well, I I mean, I hate myself. I can't speak for everyone in the community. <laughs> you and me um, both. <laughs> I, 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 like, you know. We know this much. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're both doing our best impersonation <laughs> address Thompson here, right? But Paul, right, has right. Ma- Paul has Max. Do you have any Max, Richard? Not yeah, I do. I always have a Mac. Yeah, yeah. of course. You don't I have any Macs have. at all, Richard. No. Do you but, do you, you look know. over with some interest in Envy? Well, you just described a pretty nice machine. Yes. No. I, and again, I'm a hardware guy. So when I look at the hardware, I'm like, oh, yeah, God, this is gorgeous in every and not just visually and and although yep. tactile, beautiful too. Yep. From an engineer's perspective, it is the most beautiful machine made, and has it so for a few years in a row. So macOS is what holds you back, or uh, well, yes, and and Apple's ecosystem in general doesn't yeah. fill with joy, right? Uh, now there is an iPad floating around this house. It is owned by she who must be obeyed, <laughs> and I do covet it right. because sure. all the other tablet options are horrible. Yes. Right, I'm, I've gone the. Chrome. There's no reason not to use it. You can use an iPad just as a standalone device. It, 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 I do that. It works fine. And and, and, they, and I think I'm, and it's, she's got the Magic Keyboard too, which is obscenely expensive for what it is. But you know what? That is a gorgeous machine, and it is. Yep. It, it's her morning routine. Oh, so she. I'm sorry. She is an iPad Pro. You're talking about an yeah. actual productivity machine here. Oh yeah, in some ways. Out. Now, yeah. admittedly, she works in the CAD world, so. She has all. She also has a ThinkPad Asaurus, right? Like she has one of the two yeah. ThinkPads because she needs so much horsepower for the CAD right. and side of, of clothing engineering. Yep. Uh, and that, and that, there's nothing elegant about a T series Lenovo. Like that's designed to kill <laughs> size a, animal yeah. power supply, right? Like it's that's a, a, it's, it's a nice. Tool. It's elegant in a way, and it's if in a form follows function, yeah, sort yeah, of yeah. way, right? I mean, it's a tool. Yeah. It's it, elegant. Well, uh, the type of uh, the type of machine that uh, Stacey has is not that machine. The, the, this is like a workstation class. You yeah, know, I have a T series. I love my T series. Yeah. No, no, yeah, it's elegant like a sledgehammer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it gets yeah, the job done. Very good. So, thing that it does. if somebody were from an, another planet and never used anything, and listened right. to the show, mm-hmm. I think their initial reaction would be, "Are you guys nuts? 
Why? Yeah. Why do you put up with this? Insanity? But that's like saying, but if a uh, an alien came to Earth now, they would think the cats were in charge. I mean, I can't explain. <laughs> well, that's true too. <laughs> you know why everything works the way it works, but um, that's a good, no, be, that's I, an I, excellent point. <laughs> we. I don't know why I just said that, but we. <laughs> Yeah, because you're wrong. It's not that the cats are in charge. Corn is in charge. Yeah, because there you go. Yeah, remember yeah. people's work very biologically. Hard yeah, remember the, I, Yeah, it was the Aztecs or the Mayans. They were uh, genetically some huge. They were the people of the corn, literally, physically. Yeah. We are now those people because of yeah. uh, corn syrup, and yeah, um, we're worse than that. Actually, I believe genetically, I think there's more corn in us than there were in them. Yep. Uh, that's also a, another different topic. But um, no, I mean, why do we? So I, look, when it comes to um, productivity work, what I would call traditional productivity work. We're still in a world where you, you're going to need the big screen, full size yeah. keyboard uh, pointer of some kind. Um, you know, Windows still gets nails that stuff uh, for me. Yeah. And I it's still, still have a larger diversity utilization than yeah. Mac. When you're in I, the Apple w walled garden, you got to stay in the garden. And so and there's and a, the, yeah, there's a device, gray. there's a device focus over there. I, and, and I'm not saying it's bad. I, I there are, Obviously, there are younger people coming up out of school, especially who grew up on Apple devices and Google services, and they're, they're kind of into that world. Um, I, we talk sometimes about this weird markdown uh, world of like light editors and note takers and things, and those tend to be bigger on the, the Mac than they are on the PC. You know, we kind of, in, in many ways, the PC, by which I mean the Windows PC, is sort of settling into almost a workstation role. Yeah. Um, whereas uh, the Mac is for, uh, general users, um, main, you know, who are comfortable in the Apple ecosystem. And then, of course, creative types who are using, uh, you know, video editors or whatever that might be. Not that you can't do that on Windows, <laughs> right? But that stuff, I think those people, yeah. creative people, I think, still tend to And, and, and there are classes that. of development that are done well on the Mac, and there are classes of development that are done better in Windows. Right? Yeah, like, yeah, right. That's right. Very hard. Look, this stuff is going to change. I mean, um, I was talking to somebody yesterday about this. My percent, the percentage, if you look at my apps that I kind of pinned to the taskbar now, the percentage of apps that are cross platform and or web based has grown dramatically over the years. You know, 10, 20 years ago, especially, it would have been all native Windows apps. That was the advantage. That was the point. Yep. And um, we, we, great new apps like uh, Notion or a Clipchamp, which Microsoft bought and includes in Windows, mm -hmm. are web apps. And they're very, I mean, they're, they're not elegant, just, beautiful. Yeah, app. They're, they're powerful. Really? Yeah, yeah. Um, Microsoft had trouble solving the command density problem in, in Microsoft Office. They did the ribbon, but it's still difficult because these apps are so big and complex. Yeah. Well, and, and if they and don't even talk to me about Visual Studio, like the, <laughs> well, the it's same, same, yeah, same thing. And it's yeah. it, it's it. And Photoshop is like this too. You know, if you use Photoshop a lot, even Photoshop Elements, sure. depending on what you do. You can launch a window like this happens when you save for web. The save for web window is an application I think was written by some other company. It's a little different than the rest of Photoshop. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it, it's just different because th that app is so big and complex. And UIs you see in Office can be like this. UIs you see in Visual Studio can be like this. an application with a version number that's a teenager that yes. isn't like this. Right, right. right? It's so the that's just of being around that. It's the uh, the biggest benefit of Windows is it's Achilles heel. Uh, it, and this is true of any platform, probably. But just because we're talking about Windows, it's this backwards compatibility. Yeah. Uh, no API will be left behind, you know, mentality that Microsoft has, which has served it well in some ways. Yeah. And and, uh, it is, and it is its distinctive aspect. Right. I mean, Apple very aggressively has chopped off old versions of things as they went. And that also yeah. has pros and cons, right? So I don't, I don't remember, I don't know the Mac as well, but uh, two, three versions ago, Mac did their, or Apple did their UI refresh, um, whatever version it was. Yep. And, uh, and you know, when you come from the Windows world, and you look at that, it's a little heartbreaking because they already had done all the hard work yeah. of getting rid of legacy cruft. So when they changed their UI, it actually changed everywhere. What a concept. In Windows, it's an archaeological dig of different strata of UIs and technologies and, you know, uh, it comes with overhead and it's just the way and, it the, ar is. and the architecture of the Intel processor is the same thing, right? Exactly like, the same thing. Yeah, exactly. They're carrying the same legacy around those original 63 instructions that were in the 8086 right. are still in there. Yeah. So backwards compatibility is great, but it's also it's becomes not a problem, great. you know? Yeah. Anyway, uh, that's so and and to answer Leo's question, that's why, <laughs> your, you, know, you know, neither is ruthlessly killing your grandparents, which is the Apple attitude. 
I Yikes. <laughs> okay, wait. Reach a certain age. You know, they did some, the, some really amazing things, though. Uh, for instance, when they went to Apple Silicon, their Rosetta 2 compatibility yeah. layer really right. worked. In fact, yeah. it works so well that uh, most people don't yeah, even but, know that they're not that, running. But, see, that itself, that's maybe, that's an ideal example of good decision making, and, but also like decisively choosing the right place to make a difference, right? Um, people disagree with this, but I often, t you know, people talk about, oh, there's only one web uh, rendering, I'm sorry, web rendering engine, sort of. There isn't really, but Chromium is the big thing. Oh, too bad Microsoft couldn't have kept doing their own thing. It's important to have variety and diversity and blah, 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 blah. And, and there is, but maybe not at that level. And uh, if Google, if Apple had taken that hard of a stance on their chipset, they wouldn't have done what you just described. And those old apps would have run poorly for some number of years until developers caught up. And uh, that's the problem we see on the Microsoft side with ARM because no one is adopting this platform because no one's using it. And on the Apple side, they can just say, we're switching. So you're using it. And it's it's a different world. But Apple, in that case, I think it made an incredibly right decision. Um, and just, you know, I think, and, and I know this doesn't, it's not as profound, but I think when, when Microsoft just gave up on the never ending treadmill of trying to keep up with web standards and making websites all look the same and just went with Chromium. That was the right decision. I mean, they screwed everything else up since then, but the idea that you should be competing on UI security and privacy and whatever the, you know, and features uh, is maybe the right one. You know, uh, it, it's, I, I think that battle's over, but of course Apple actually disagrees on that one too, because they have Safari. So yeah, right, who can say? Yeah. And it's doing pretty good. So, it's interesting. I didn't know they had a 5% uh, increase. That's really interesting. It, and that's a staggering yeah. number. When that is 25% more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Apple's uh, market share used to be like Microsoft stock price. Single, it was like single a digit. flat line yeah. forever, you yeah. know, forever. And um, there's been little bumps. But, you know, the, the Apple Silicon story to me for the first couple of years was it didn't move the needle that much. But uh, what's happening now? <laughs> you know, it's starting to move. So we'll see. I can't. Use I, I still I kind of hate the Mac I, I like Richard I, I love the the hardware. <laughs> what do you hate? I, I'm just curious. I, it's an interesting. I, every it's time a I pick it up, I'm, no, it, it takes me. You could put you could put a timer on it. How soon before he throws it back down and says no? It's usually less than a minute. Wow. It's just some. It's it, I, I find them very difficult to use, and huh. I, and I use. I actually, I mean, I always have one at least, and I sometimes more than one. Uh, I do use them from time to time. They're around. It's not like I. I it, it's not like. Uh, it's been five years or something. It's, I haven't used one since I came to Mexico, but I was using one right before I came to Mexico. Uh, I just don't like it. <laughs> I don't know yeah. how to explain it. Yeah. I, I, yeah. That's completely it's fair. Happy. Yeah. Even Chrome OS to me is a little more familiar, uh, maybe yeah. because it's a little more like Windows. When my uh, you are, you are, $5,000 M3 Max <laughs> notebook comes, I will oh, be Oh, did you get one, really? Yeah. 16? Uh uh, no, only in fourteen. Ball. I don't. I don't like a 14. sixteen. I decided. I thought I did. <laughs> I want one. I can use. I want a laptop. I can I use like as a flotation device if the plane goes down. If um, <laughs> or you know, a tray like a table. I don't want. I don't want to be like that guy at the end of uh, Titanic. He there wasn't room for him on there. You know? <laughs> There's always room on a sixteen. No, yeah. I got the fourteen because I can run. You know, three six K monitors yeah, if I want I off of it. So if I need more screen real estate, but I wanted real portability. But uh, but the only reason I mention it uh, is mm -hmm. to say that I will be uh, trying Windows on ARM on Parallels yeah. on it, and I think you will find it is wonderful. <laughs> yeah, know? and I think as that's kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean. Yep. Uh, this is, you know, 40 core GPU. Uh, I mean, this right. thing is a beast. Yeah. Yeah. They, they were claiming uh, 11 times faster than the Intel iMac. <laughs> Whenever you see yeah, I, something is 11 yeah, times know. faster, that's... What was the, what generation processor was that running, though? That's not, I mean, obviously that's not fair. People who like Apple will say they're only comparing that because that's who they know is going to operate. Apple says, like, and they, you know, you take this with a grain of salt if you want, but Apple says it's because so many people still have Intel Macs. Yeah. And I really know. that that's a sweet spot of the market for them is to get these people finally to be they using are in Apple the business Silicon. of selling hardware. Yeah, right, like that's, that's right. what they that's want right. you to buy the new hardware. Yeah, and a lot of people are still running those Intel Macs. Uh, we yeah. just got rid of Lisa. Just got rid of uh, her Intel uh, yeah. iMac Pro, five K. Did she notice how quiet her office was uh, when she got rid of it? <laughs> you know, this, these new iMacs are dead silent. They really yeah. are. Yeah. 
Uh, that's another thing, interesting I mean, uh, little thing that Apple threw in, and I don't know if it got a lot of attention, is that their performance benchmarks are identical whether the machine's plugged in or not. Yeah. And I don't think that's yes, the case on any uh, right. Windows machine, right? You, you, it's uh, Intel slows down. Uh, I mean, it you can, it can be, it can yeah, be. If you don't if want you more don't than half an hour of battery life, right? You're like, quick, you run the benchmark. Watch that battery drain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I mean, it could be. I can, I can run the benchmark the same performance on this laptop uh, on battery. It just can't. Finish. It's quite a flex to say, yeah, you can. You know, you're going to get 11 hour or 22 hour battery life, 22 on the 16, right. uh, and it'll run the same whether you're plugged yeah, in or not. Yeah, yeah. It's quite a flex. I don't. I can't speak. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I do think you'll it'll shorten the battery life. Like you're gonna cause if you stay at full at full bore, the battery. Yeah. Gonna go down fast. Yeah. Okay. So actually, this was I was just gonna comment to something related to this, which is I I have spoken to people from uh, PC makers, Intel, uh, AMD, Qualcomm, right? And there is this shift occurring in the industry about how these processes work with cores and how things come on and shut off automatically, and mm -hmm. these things are gonna more dynamically handle power management chores as needed, right? And Apple has, given all the cores they have and everything they have uh, and the prowess they have just in this field, they must be doing the same thing, right? You would hope. That, that the way this battery life and performance thing works is that they've had to completely re-architect the underlying system that can, you know, for handling the power management of those cores and what they do and how they go on and off, et cetera, et cetera. So that's become very sophisticated. And I, um, well, this whole we notion benefit, do. of efficiency cores and performance cores comes from the ARM yes. side, right? But even uh, that, Intel's doing it, it now. They are, but ultimately that sounds unsophisticated compared to what AMD is starting to do and what I, I believe Qualcomm is doing on uh, their new PC chipsets, and I assume Apple is doing on their stuff, which is, well, Apple, no, Apple does have power and efficiency cores, don't they? Yeah, I, I, it, you know who you doesn't? Core, instead, Qualcomm, well, AMD doesn't. Qualcomm, Qualcomm has no right. efficiency cores. They, they, they have all cores that can performance cores. Yeah, so AMD did that on uh, uh, HP, um, whatever that chip is, the HP uh, Dragonfly Pro. They have um, a single type of core that can scale between power and efficiency ah, modes and turn off entirely. Right. And they override the Windows power management system. Do they call it so speed step? <laughs> No, it's. I think a turbo. No, I don't. Um, I don't remember the speech, Is there a turbo it's like button? A, it's a, yeah, it's a DX processor. I think. Was the, I, don't, I don't remember. I don't know. We won't. You know. I mean, obviously, we won't until we get MMX. Our hands on, I could do this all day, Leo. Oh, thank you when for we, setting me up. <laughs> when we get these <laughs> Apple laptops, I'll do benchmarks uh, on them, uh, and we'll get a better idea. Yeah, but, uh, this stuff's just getting better across the board. And I, I honestly, I think Apple. Look, uh, as much as people may resent it in the PC space. This was exactly the kick in the pants that everyone in the industry needed from the operating system vendors to the app writers to the most importantly, the chipset vendors. Right. Mm -hmm. um, to, and, uh, you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens. And Apple, with the Apple did this the, when they did made the air the first time back in the day. Right. With their highly integrated chip. No, you know, no uh, modularity at all. It's like what you get is what you get. You order it and then you, you, there's no memory expansion or anything like that. Yeah. And it forced the PC makers, actually Intel financed the PC makers of the world to make the Ultrabook. Ultrabook, yeah, better. exactly. That's exactly So, right. I mean, in that sense, Apple drove the industry forward. They said, hey, yep. build a fully integrated machine. You get better about a life thinner, a machine thin enough you can julienne fries with it. <laughs> and, <laughs> right. and they've done it again with the M series processors. Well, like, what if you put and, everything and, on the same die? And I guess right. uh, if I wanted to defend Microsoft, I would say, well, that's because they have a smaller market and they have it's a smaller risk. And most of Apple's oh, revenue you, you, is from the iPhone anyway. So, you know what, though? Well, I, they can I, experiment. I, so, Apple is a hardware company, and Microsoft. Yep. Well, that's so, so, I got. I, the, it we're going way off. It. Yeah, its CEO is a hardware guy, right? Right, like yeah. when Tim worked for Steve, he was the guy who the operations guy, supplier. Yeah. yeah. Well, he had come from. Well, does anyone remember where he came from? The company name? His name was Dell, as I remember. No, Compaq. Compaq, of course. Yeah, yeah. Compaq. yeah. yeah. It should be Dell. Yeah. Uh, which well, HP. Bought Compaq, I think, at some point. I don't remember. But yeah. um, anyway, so t just a couple of things. Uh, you know, a million years ago, when Microsoft was personal computing and um, Apple was tiny uh, comparatively and uh, Google was nothing yet and Amazon was nothing yet, the big argument in the Windows space about the stuff we were just talking about, the alien comes to Earth or whatever, and why are you running this thing? You know, the argument back then was we have to keep all this stuff in there because our user base is so big and diverse. If we take out one little feature, there's going to be a group over here that really needs it. 
But uh, Android and iOS are right up there with Windows now, or not, if not bigger, and they don't have this problem, <laughs> you know? So you can make these decisions. Like a lot of companies would not have done what Apple did by saying what Richard was talking about, putting everything on the same die, which restricts certain things that we as PC users love. The ability to upgrade RAM after the fact, for example, right? That kind of thing. The ability to add a new or better GPU. Um, so, but Apple just said, yeah, uh, you know, we understand that, we're going to we'll lose We'll do it all things. for you. We'll do it all for yeah. you. No, well, no, but you, it's interesting that it can absolutely upgrade those things on an Apple device. You just have to buy, buy a new one. Apple device. <laughs> yes, okay. Right, that's the upgrade path. Um, but yeah, but, but you see, uh, that's a step uh, the PC industry wouldn't have taken uh, ever because that the was not the, the plan. That was not how things worked. And uh, I bet now we're going to start to see things like that uh, happening. I made a you know? great, great rant years ago about how the iPad saved the laptop. Because before the iPad, the race for the laptop was to get to the $500 laptop. Yeah, five hundred, three hundred, man. Yeah. Yeah. Inch mm -hmm. and a half thick, all plastic, like just the yeah. worst. The net netbook. This was net the netbook. They were yeah. terrible machines. And then yep. in came this $800. Element. <sighs> right. It was so beautiful. And it's, you couldn't sell a laptop at, in that price range because you'll buy an iPad. Like, why would you right. do anything else? And so, the, in that sense, the so the laptop recalibrated as at least twelve hundred dollar device. Yeah, right. Built a nice laptop. Yeah. For yep. Yep. That's yeah. Cool. So I I, I didn't it's mean to turn this into all praise Apple. They don't do everything right, but I but uh, there's some uh, there's all kinds the of company ways that can... brought you the new. <laughs> okay. Well, except it's not that company, is it? Like, no, I mean, that was it, John right? Scully's company. I mean, We've come a yeah, long I mean, way, baby. It's a different company. Um, so, I, by the I, way, I, though, I, I, you could probably say that. Remember that the Newton inspired Apple to invest in start a little thing, Acorn Arm. Risk Machines, which became Arm. That's right. And uh, and you could probably say that the iPhone was is a direct like great 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 grandchild of of yeah, the Newton. So as a, much as we might deprecate, it's the more Newton. like one of Thomas Jefferson's slave children. But it's it's a uh, <laughs> oh. Ow. But when I do the futurist conversation, um, I always use that line. It's like, is it a Newton or is it an iPhone? Right. Right. Like right. Newton there was a good uh, was same class the product in a lot of respects. It was ahead of the technology. Yeah. Yeah, they released it, and that happens. Early. Right. Yep. We get and Microsoft used to do this all the time. It's been a long time since they've done that. Well, no, AI is that, isn't it? I mean, it's, uh, you know, yeah. maybe they're doing it again. No, it's a, it's a fair question to say, are these co-pilots all Newtons? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I've been saying that about uh, Vision Pro so and Quest and all that, too. It's the, you Wait, know, we're I, all just I, a Newton. We, we've been walking around that point, which like, does Vision Pro going to be the AR device or is it a Newton? It's a Newton. Like, is it, yeah. I think it's too far yeah. a Newton. Yeah. I don't think it's that clear. Give me the killer app. And I think there's a bunch of developers working right now trying to find it. And, you know, I, I, and I hope they succeed. I'd like to get on with the AR world. That'd be awesome. I don't even mind if it's Apple's device. But mm -hmm. you release the device without the software. You punted. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right, right, right. Hmm. Should we talk about Windows 12? Because that'll be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Let me do a break and then uh, Windows yeah. 12. Yeah. Windows 12, really? What? We aren't even at 11 yet, are we? What? Look, I'm doing the Apple thing. We're, we, the iPhone just came out. We're looking at the next iPhone. Yeah. You know, boy, that's, that's true cool. in the Apple uh, journalism space. Oh, Before brutal. they even announced it, practically, they were doing rumors for the iPhone 15. Yeah. Uh, it's it's incredible. Our show today brought to you by Lookout. Lookout. Business has changed forever. Boundaries to where we work or even how we work have changed, disappeared. No more boundaries. That means your data <laughs> is always on the move, whether it's on a device in the cloud, across networks, or even at the local coffee shop. Now, that's great for your workforce. They love that. It's a challenge for IT security. I think we can agree. Lookout is the answer. It helps you control your data and free your workforce. With Lookout, you'll gain complete visibility into all your data so you can minimize risk from external and internal threats, plus ensure compliance. By seamlessly securing hybrid work, your organization doesn't have to sacrifice productivity for security. And Lookout makes IT security and, their, and the job of IT security a lot simpler. You know, I mean, if... If your IT department is, and it probably is right now, working with multiple point solutions and legacy tools, 
that's just too complex. And you know what? Complexity leads to missing things, errors, and ultimately holes in your security. Lookout's single unified platform reduces that IT complexity, which means you can, A, you're going to be more secure, and B, you can focus more on whatever else comes your way. You're, you're ready. Good data protection shouldn't be a cage. It's a springboard letting you and your organization bound toward the future of your making. Visit Lookout.com today to learn how to safeguard data, secure hybrid work, and reduce IT complexity. Lookout. Dot com. We thank them so much for supporting Windows Weekly and invite you to go there and check it out and support us too at lookout.com. We now return you to Mexico City and Madeira or Madpa, BC, Madpa, BC, Madpa. Paul Therott, Richard Campbell, and uh, Windows mm. 12. What? I, like the, I like the term springboard from the app. Isn't that That's good? good? Springboard. Okay. Microsoft oh, yeah. used to have a springboard program. What? Oh, yeah. What was that? It was to get people to move to Windows 7. Oh. Um, you know, they didn't really need it. Everyone wanted to move to Windows 7, so that worked out fine. Yeah. But, yeah. Is it, you know, so Rose. that brings up the uh, specter of the every other Microsoft version yeah. rule of thumb. A the, uh, Star the Star Trek movie rule. <laughs> every other, every one, other one, is one is garbage and every other one is good <laughs> so let me think 7 was good 8 was bad 10 was good was 11 bad and what will 12 think, be? 11 was bad at release it's it's there I, I think, think 11 is as good as 10 it. 11 is 10 yeah with game Boy. well there, a lot of little um day-to-day -day workflows that were uh, removed in the initial version of windows 11 that screwed people up mm -hmm. um and there's still some in there you know right, uh, they had to be put back yeah, yeah, they responded. I just, remember, we talked about this a few weeks ago. Complain, Microsoft uh, tied to their n no uh, API left behind. Uh, if enough people complain, we'll we'll mm -hmm. change things, right? Put them back. So they're pretty good at that. I mean, I'll give them a little credit for that. Um, yeah. So I, I, because of everything that's going on with uh, Windows 11 23 H2 and uh, all the AI stuff, and I started looking back. You know. Uh, we forget this because this year happened in such a blur. I think for a lot of people, this year began in February when Microsoft announced Bing Chat, and uh, and then uh, yeah, re rifled through the rest of the year with Microsoft 365 Copilot and Build and all the announcements there, and Windows Copilot, and and we raced into the fall with all this stuff. But actually, <laughs> there were hints of this coming before then. You know, so back in uh, January, um, Satya Nadella talked about adding chat GPT capabilities. This is the open AI technology that we knew Microsoft was investing in, but didn't know they were getting ready to kind of oh, integrate into everything, right? Um, he talked about putting it in every Microsoft product. And I started writing about AI at that time before when, you know, Bing and all that stuff. And I, I, uh, I talked about how AI might be the next wave. That thing Terry Myerson used to talk about, Microsoft had missed the smartphone wave they wanted to make sure they didn't miss the next wave. There was a brief period of time where that could have been uh, digital assistance, like they had Cortana, that didn't happen. They got um, there late. That, yeah, and they got there late too. Mm -hmm. um, and now the theory may, may be, a theory, actually I came up with this theory, I'm sure others have too, it's not just me, but you know, maybe AI, and now increasingly obvious AI probably is the next wave. And so uh, months ago, uh, or not months ago, I, right around the time Microsoft announced um, Bing chat, mm -hmm. I wrote, this is Windows 10, predicting that Microsoft would release an AI-focused version of Windows that they would call, did I just say Windows 10? Yeah. Uh, Windows, well, I did, I'm sorry, Windows 12. Right. And, um, and, and we were talking live on this show, and I sort of blurted out, maybe they would require an NPU. Maybe they just tested this hardware compatibility block on 11. What if they did the same thing for 12, but for yeah. a, an NPU. Now, yeah. logically, of course, you scale that back in your brain. You think there's no way there's going to do something like that. And the delta between the release of TPM 2.0 and its requirement in Windows 11 is several years, at least. It might yeah. even be over 10. A lot hours. of years. Yeah. A lot of years. So that's rapid. I, but the thing that's interesting is Microsoft has never once uttered the term Windows 12 this year, ever, not once. But there have been multiple times where they appear to be talking about exactly that. 
they refer to these things as like some future windows. Yeah, or they, there's gonna, but then in turn, normally they will always talk about B next. They never yeah. know what it's going to be. Yeah, right. I, I find it fascinating almost a year later now that we still have never heard anyone say Windows 12, yeah. even though we all out here in the community are like, it's, you know what's happening. Yeah, you know what's happening. You know, That's also because they're really, uh, they are late getting people moving to 11, specifically enterprise. Yeah, but the, you know what? The, you know, Don't give them anyway. you, the, if anybody said the word 12, a lot of enterprises are going to go, we're waiting for 12. The, this is the, um, I think the push that they need, even if it's fairly arbitrary, mm-hmm. where you're resetting a support cycle, they're going to be upgrading hardware anyway. Yep. It's fully compatible. It's going to be a, another entitlement package, right? It's going to be on the same build chain, whatever. This has been proven over multiple years now. It's stable. The hardware compat is there. I think that's what will do it. And honest, it doesn't have to be too much more than Windows 11 version, I guess, 4. Yeah. Um, It'll be 10.2, to be clear. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, that is actually pretty accurate. But I keep waiting for someone to slip up. They've come so close. Yeah. There are so many times. The Qualcomm event was another one. Yeah, another great um, time. But and I, they just, I, they I'm sort sure of, they, you know. Pretty sure they don't know. I mean, here's the here's the essential problem with that. What's the NPU going to do? Right. That's that the killer app. Exactly. This and is the problem is, in large language models, which is the current excitement in the artificial intelligence space. And I loathe to use a term because it's a terrible term. Yep. But large language models are massive. They have to run in the cloud. They're yeah, Right. And so they're not going to fit in your MPU. But then, unless you, you, your MPU is going to be more powerful than the rest of the computer combined by miles it to be able to run an LLM locally. It's just like it's math. So here, I mean, here you, I agree with you in the sense of the next version of Windows could be hugely. The, you want to make an OS relevant again? Put an LLM as its principal interface. What do you need to do today? Yeah, and let and and let it guide. I, I, I don't. Did you either of you? I mean, I know mo- both of you probably are. You know, know that Google a month ago, or whatever, launched a new generation of Pixel phones, and one of the things they sort of previewed mentioned anyway was that this would be the first phone that would have a reduced llm that would fit on the device right right? and we we don't know but we've heard rumors that microsoft because you know things like bing chat and bing image create and windows copilot are free ad supported doesn't really pay the bills and ai is expensive that they too are looking at what was i think the information had a report on this these mini AIs, right, that would kind of reduce, I know, help re- reduce the load uh, a bit, right? The problem with an, a, a, an LLM on the internet is the internet is essentially infinite, <laughs> you know? The nice thing about uh, something like Microsoft 365 Copilot, if you're sticking within your organization, is that you have a nice concrete set of data, right? It, it may be coming from a bunch of different places, but it's still, it's not the internet. now. It does, in fact, bring in the internet too. But if you could make this thing make sense for specific tasks, the stupid version of that is um, this it does not involve an LLM, but like the uh, Windows Studio FX stuff that they have on the ARM PCs, mm-hmm. um, background blur, et cetera, et cetera. I think what they want to do is look at specific features, I guess I'll call it, just like some of the AI features that are in photos and uh, the paint app now. Um, and accelerate those things and do so in a way. You know, and you're reminding me of the 1970s version of artificial intelligence with expert system. Yeah, right. Jeez. So I'm going to ask you this dumb question again, because I ask you every time. Mm -hmm. The model that you train, you train in the cloud because you need lots of data. And you need an infinite amount of data. But you can right. create a model. Stable Diffusion's models are 1.6 gigabytes. I can run Stable Diffusion on a phone. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, in other words, you have and Google a selection has, And they even said this at, at, at w, uh, whatever it is, Google I.O., uh, how they've really gotten good at compressing these models that, you know, you create yeah. in the cloud so that they can run on the phone. But then you can kind of port a smaller version of it to a device of whatever kind, yeah, right? Because we're going to have these. Then. But Richard, you said you need a lot. I mean, you don't want to run... AI the, the, on a phone. The reason we're talking about how expensive LLMs are and, and, and so forth is because they are terabyte size model. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just, well, okay. So stable diffusion works with a 1.6 gigabyte model. 
Here, here's a actually here's a historical example. I think that everyone will understand and super simplifies this conversation, which is that when Microsoft was moving to Windows, what became Windows Vista, the big talk at that time was hardware accelerated graphics. Right, Apple had done it on the Mac and embarrassed Windows. Windows XP had a, a bitmapped UI that was fixed size. It looked like something you would have created as a child in Microsoft Paint, by comparison. Right, so th this is a big thing. They have to do. Uh, hardware uh, resolution independent graphics, hardware accelerated graphics, all this kind of stuff. If you have a GPU, an early GPU on a computer that could run Windows Vista and you could display Aero Glass, which was that see through kind of transparent UI, you could actually have better performance and battery life because you were taking the load off of the CPU. Right. Right. And I look at MPUs in the same way. There are going to be these specific tasks that you're going to take the load, processing load off of the GPU in this case, or the CPU, depending on what you might have otherwise. Mm -hmm. And that the MPU is just um, specifically designed to handle those types of yeah. computations or whatever, right? And that, well, I mean, that's the result, that's the goal, right? And my, the, and Microsoft should be all over this because yeah. it's how you charge less. So there's processing the NPU, but there's also the data sets. Right. Does, for instance, ChatGPT4, do we know how big that data set is that it's using? No, they've, it's, they've kept it a secret because it's, it's multiple terabytes. Yeah, it's, it's huge. A, yeah, it's a, yeah. it's a private company with a very Google-like uh, investing scheme. So when I phone, use ChatGPT you know. on my phone, it's slower because it's connecting to the server. And then, right. uh, and then I can talk to it, and then, and then it's yeah. a few seconds later, I mean, it comes back with an answer. But I, would, I would also argue that G, that GPT four especially was a brute force approach to well, if three was good, making right. yeah. it yeah, seven yeah. times bigger will be better. Right. Right. And even when they built three it, right. at the time, you know, Mark Rosinovich was on record as saying we built the fifth largest supercomputer in the world inside of Azure to Just build to run GPT this thing. Yeah. yeah. Three but right. that was training. Oh, then there's a trained data set, which, yeah. by the way, is frozen in time. And yeah. that, that frozen in time data set then gets moved onto another server. But that could yeah. itself be terabytes. But um, I would also argue that this is a generalized model because they're experimenting. Most of the AI like, that we do right now, though, is things, and I know I can do it on phone, like mm -hmm. text, speech to text. Uh, or uh, removing an object from a photo. Removing or, an object uh, or removing sound in the background. All of those things right. the Pixel 8 can do. Yeah, but the, the stuff that we kind of, I think, requires the bigger models, even dumb things like tell me a joke, right? Which I, I technically could be as stupid as a table of jokes, right? Right. But the assumption is that it's not, that it's literally generating something based on a topic. Or that would have tell to me be a, a chat GPT. Would have to be a four sized model. Have to be, have to be, right? Okay. Have to be. Yeah. Yep. Does it? Yeah, I mean, the question is, and I think this is what's the experiments that are going on right now, is when you start working on a specific data set, whether it's a particular role like manipulating an image or a specific data set like your company data, can you use a simpler language model, a smaller one? And that's the, maybe that's the, you know, that's, by the way, that's a great point. So uh, like a Microsoft 365 Copilot implementation that uses an MPU you could almost have MPUs that would be sized to different enterprise sizes or something. Well, uh, also, uh, ironically, the things that pro the productivity things you want to do probably do work fine with a smaller model. It's that very general yes. AGI yep. where you wanted right. to tell a joke or tell me a story or something right. that takes not time. AGI. Well, like, but well okay, okay. Virgin <laughs> but, AGI, but it's not it's, even close to AGI. But, no, <laughs> AGI, like okay, but we're come being, on. Yes. Yeah, you're right. But they. But that's. In the other point. words, the more general and the less useful, the, the bigger future the model. Of H, uh, the future yeah. of AI is is hybrid, right? So and here's the, the things the, that can run local will. The things that don't will go to the cloud. Yeah. The, the parallel I see from the work I've done in the past is data warehousing and OLAP cubes, where we always initially built like the mother of all cubes, this gigantic thing, because we weren't sure exactly what we wanted, and it cost a fortune to build. It took years to put together. Right. And out of that, you learned enough about your data to then carve off these smaller, incredibly useful cubes that were cheaper to run and could run more locally. Like everything was better. And GPT-4 feels like one of those mother of all cubes approaches. Yep. And now we're looking around it saying, well, what pieces can we hack off and do? Yeah, no, it be, right. It becomes about making it efficient, right? Yeah. Or, or, or in, in maybe efficient to specific implementations or specific. Yeah. Well, and that's when you say efficient, that's what you're talking about. It's yeah. like, well, I need all of this. Or is smaller, it smaller and faster, right? And less expensive, right? That, yeah. Well, and it's part, part of the reason you really don't hear about a GPT-5. It's like, from what to where? Where yeah, would it yeah, exist? Yeah. What's the next order of magnitude? They're building it in space. Trillion, 
<laughs> you know, I don't know. Yeah. So I mean, I'm, I'm excited about all of this because also a point of maturity is when you say, hey, we don't need to get bigger. In fact, there's places for us to get small. Yeah. As long as you're still on the race to just I bet we've cr- I, I think you're right. I think maybe they've crested that hill, right? I, that's what it feels like yeah. to me. No, I think and you're that's, right. That's good news. But it I do feel news. like the problem with these MPUs is you, you're still struggling for the workload to know what the MPU needs to look like. And that may only be a few months away. This is the problem for people that want to adopt this stuff early. Um, mm-hmm. You'll get a first gen MPU based PC, and you're going to want another one in a year or two. You know, but you know, um, you're my favorite kind of customer. Yeah, right. right, like right. They, and it, and it's it's one of the ways you can go. And let's face it, like if Mid Journey or Dali will run well locally right. on that machine, that should be enough. That's but, what Qualcomm showed off, by the way, at their event. I, I I started a pre briefing, but the, the oh no, wait, I started this. It's might have been earlier in the year. Um, it doesn't matter. But I saw a, a demo where they did that locally on a on a arm based PC, and um, I mean that's a nice step, you know. It's, yeah, and, and it is speaking to the right size. So, and then the next step is, can you run Crisis on it? I mean, it's uh, pretty much <laughs> those are the two steps. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, um, I have I looked for this during the commercial break. Um, micro, it's November 1st, as we record, yep. Microsoft is supposed Where's to release Microsoft. Where's my co-pilot, Paul? Yeah, and if you go to the Microsoft 365 blog, maybe it changed since I looked, but uh, there's no new, there is an announcement post, it's from September. <laughs> so um, I, I have uh, I have questions about this thing. I will say, of the Microsoft co-pilots from a productivity standpoint, this is the one that's the most exciting for all the obvious yeah. reasons, right? Um, there is this chat experience they built into it called Microsoft 365 chat that works across all the apps. It allows you to prompt uh, the AI as you do with Bing chat, except uh, to find out information from your organization internally, right? Email, meeting, chats, documents, whatever. Yeah. Um, I think that stuff's cool. There are very specific features for all of the core office apps, Outlook, Word, PowerPoint, Excel, um, some goofy apps too, like I think uh, Loop. Yeah, um, uh, Loop is I'm, very uh, emotional. I've been living more in Loop. Okay, that's interesting. I, yeah, I want I I want to get there, and I I've been I've not been able to. One note stream incredibly difficult. Yeah, yeah. so there's all this stuff. Everyone talks about the expense. Uh, it's a it's a legit thing to talk about. I mean, this initial version targets enterprises for the most part. There is actually a system where small businesses could get involved with this, but yeah, I thought there was a minimum number of seats. That's the that was the question I had because I can't get a, a clear answer on this one. No. I have found yeah, the uh, number I heard uh, flying around was minimum three hundred seats. Three hundred seats. Get that yep. from a data size perspective. Like if you're if you're really going to do this thing where you're going to analyze the graph, and yep. become so, the librarian of your company. If you're good at math, uh, do this for me then. Uh, three hundred uh, times thirty. That's easy. That's nine thousand oh. times thirty six mm-hmm. is about ninety. Probably a hundred something thousand. Yep. That's your minimum cost per month because you need a Microsoft. Uh, every user uh, has to be on E3 at least. That's thirty six dollars per user per month. Um, the uh, Copilot upsell is thirty bucks per user per month, and then you need three hundred of them. <laughs> that's right. So that's the minimum. 20 grand, Twenty grand a month. We're talking about about a lot of money. Uh, yeah, listen, you were already paying the thirty six, right? Because that's no, no, how I, people I, do the work. The the adding doubling the price essentially with the additional thirty dollars. The always the question is, are you getting the productivity boost? And as yep. you know, right. And if you look the, at the, the list, number that seems to be coming out of the GitHub Copilot space, like they when I'm now we're seeing more and more developers working routinely, is a thirty percent right. improvement in productivity. Yeah, this is something I I, I, I a lot of, most of my audience is not developers, and I kind of I live in the space a little bit. I'm, I'm I, it's a weird slant that I have, but. Even in the goofy software development that I have done, I have—I don't want to say wasted, but I—but I've spent so much time Googling something, going to Stack Overflow, whatever the, one of the other top five sites are, reading the answers, reading the answers, the answers, and reading and realizing that one wasn't doing it, and right. looking at the ones that are top rated, trying to realize no, that doesn't work either. And the idea of not just uh, not having to go somewhere else and find this and spend that time, but to have it happen in line. Yeah, um, like everything else AI related of this type, and this would include productivity work, right? Software development is sort of like that, right? Mm-hmm. As long you have to always kind of asterisk it, as long as it's right, yes, right, or and accurate, it, and, and something like twenty five percent of the time it is wildly wrong. Yeah, so I 
I think we all agree it's probably going to get there. We may disagree on how fast that happens, whatever. But I, my argument has been, A, software developers are already good at criticizing code from other sources, full stop. So that's yeah. fine. The compiler so, so, always get a, gets a say. I was going to say, between uh, compiling and uh, actually running the app and using it, I mean, you can figure out if code doesn't work. Well, you know, wildly depending wrong on the app. is the least of your problems, because you can yes. see that, or the compiler right. will see that. It's the yeah. subtly wrong that introduces That's a security right. flaw that nobody discovers for five yeah. years that you really should be worried about. Even there though you, you wrote the prompt to say, and make sure my code is... <laughs> yeah, make sure... Yeah, right. yeah, well, you did, you did that. You did your uh, due diligence there. Yeah. We had a... Well, <laughs> <laughs> we had a great uh, episode last week on, or, yeah, I'm sorry, yesterday on, on Security Now, looking at a long-standing uh, bug in Citrix, and uh, and uh, which had been zero date and and widely used, and it was simply because the guy assumed that SN printf would return uh, a string. Well, it does right. return a string of a proper length because it it mm -hmm. it's it's safe. Right. But it the value it returns is the length that it parsed, which may be longer than the string. And then this mm -hmm. guy foolishly, instead of testing the length that it parsed, used the length that it parsed to allocate a buffer and put the string in. And oh, so it's classic. It's a, it, it's a classic it's a, old school. Uh, it's a subtle buffer. error, easy to make. <laughs> you could yeah. probably get that on Stack Overflow pretty quick. And mm -hmm. you might. And the thing is, it the code works just fine until right. somebody tries to. You know, break it. You know, intentionally. So I, uh, uh, I think this is in the notes. I assume it is. Yeah. Um, here, here's the productivity. Yeah. So, uh, well, it's a little further down, but let me just jump to this right now because there, there's a, there's an example of what you just described that will impact a lot more people directly. A, a programming error like that will actually impact a lot of people uh, indirectly, right? When they run the software, but. Um, my wife and I are professional writers, and we both rely on Microsoft Word and whatever correction technologies it has built in to help us find grammar, spelling, tone, whatever type errors. Um, I publish almost universally to the web, and so I use something called Grammarly, which is a plugin for a web browser a to uh, give it love. Yes, they're fantastic. It, well, we'll get to that. Um, they're fantastic. They're better than Word. I put it that way. So um, they do a second pass, and I'll tell you the article I wrote about this topic probably a couple, uh, two, 3,000 words maybe. Um, Grammarly, as it always does, found between 12 and 15 errors that Microsoft Word did not catch. Microsoft Word, which celebrated a 40th anniversary last week, that is the inarguably the, the most uh, powerful word processor on the planet, has really uncertified when it comes to this kind of thing. Now, I, I am that person that everyone talks about with AI, that person that stands behind, between, sorry, what AI says and what goes out to the world. I know enough about writing the, to know you're the human. How often? <laughs> yeah, I know how often it's wrong. The pilot. problem. The problem is most people aren't professional writers. Right. Yeah. And in this case, I'm just talking about Word. You could apply this to Excel, anything else. It, imagine the writing that can occur that could start wars, that could kill people, literally kill people. Uh, the bad writing, the wrong writing, right? That could give bad medical advice. Uh, that could cre invent a legal defense that doesn't exist that could uh, issue a ruling that would cause criminals to get out of jail. You could okay. go on and on and on. This you could get why you need that person, right? Like this is why you need that person. So this is the problem. And and it's the, the and, and seriously, it's simply stated, everyone knows this is the problem, but we also have to acknowledge we know that most people aren't going to do it. They're not going to stand between the AI and the output. Right, I think they're going to copy and gonna, paste, but they're already gonna, doing that from from Stack Overflow. I mean, yes, <laughs> of course. I mean, I, I, the nice thing about code, in a way, although your exception proves uh, this point to be false, is that at least as a developer, you can run code and sort of see it, and, and hopefully, you're doing that due diligence on the other end. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I at least know, when but, it comes to security, most of these flaws are so subtle. For instance, yeah. one of the big bugs was uh, in a in um, I think it was a uh, Heartbleed in uh, OpenSSH was because they'd used reference code from Intel, and right. Intel wrote the reference code. It's good code, but and, wrote it with that. I'm sure safety. they said there is no security. To, yes, this like, is I, this is you, reference code. You see this all the time in, yeah. in um, uh, sample code. It's like look, this, I'm trying to make a point here in the in the book. I'm not trying to 
uh, you write the full app that will be secure and will you know uh, yeah. support all the different this is just reference it, it, codes. This is, you this should is rewrite this. Thing. You should not use it. <laughs> no one, no one does. That's my point. No one. Does Nobody it. does. Everybody just uses it. Nobody does it. Yeah. And that's what it's awful. <laughs> um, so Grammarly is better than Word. Microsoft has a. I'm a glad Microsoft it caught editor. distance. That was very yeah. smart. Actually, saw these. I mean, it's crazy. Like some of some of the my wife and I, because we're writers and because we are not particularly entertaining. Will yell word mistakes to each other down the hall <laughs> from our respective offices. I love that. Like you never get like as That's if we're trying so to one up each other. Party at your place. You know, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. We're, yeah. we're fascinating. Uh, you, uh, it's it, it's gotten worse. The the problem is it's gotten worse, and it's weird that this is happening just as Microsoft is pushing AI, and it, it's a little simplistic. But I always sort of say to myself the same thing. I don't understand how I'm going to trust your AI if you can't spell check properly. Yeah. You know, I, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Well, it's the same, isn't in a way, it isn't spell checking thing? kind of? That's what I'm saying. AI. Like, yeah, think about, think not. about, go back in time, twenty, grammar uh, checking, uh, is. thirty years ago, thirty years ago, right? So Microsoft Word spell check back in the day, in the early days of Windows three and three one, right? It was, you know, it was just a table of words. Yeah, it, it would check nothing. it against it was, a word it, list and say, well, but that's once not you in move into list. something like, right? But once you move into grammar. You That's get into some actual hard computer yeah. science. Yeah. You need to understand tense and purpose and context. It's it's hard to and and, and you know, Word is honestly has always done a pretty good job of it. You know, this, really I wouldn't even expect Word to get this distant distance right. I'm impressed it's that Grammarly did, frankly. It's astonishing how much it gets yeah. wrong. Like it's astonishing. And that's probably because that Grammarly, Grammarly, Grammarly knows that phrase in the distant past. And so but it's how a does little, word not know? You're telling yeah. me that this thing's been around for 40 years. It's not better at this <laughs> than this brand new thing? And it wants to put I mean, the in front of lockstep. Hey, it's a noun it's a, where it's a definitive know, article. Think, yeah, I, uh, I don't do this anymore, but there was a long period of time where, especially with books, like printed books, I would read out loud because you catch things yeah, yeah. in the reading, yeah. you know. Yeah, um, that's a, I, I think that's absolutely true. Pogue, David Pogue does yeah. that. Uh, John C. Dvorak yeah. said, said he does that. I think it's very important. You have to, right? And uh, for big, you know, and, and I, I don't do it for like a, new, a 300 word news no, post or whatever, no. but back in the day, important writing, you would kind of do this kind of thing. And I feel like AI could, again, if it works, there's always the asterisk, right? If it works, uh, could serve this purpose, right? Oh, like your reader um, over your shoulder kind of thing. Yeah, like that should be the point of it. Yeah. In fact, my uh, my wife told me that the way she uses uh, Grammarly in this case is Grammarly actually has a thing that will read it, it to does you. That. And she has some, yeah. Yeah. she has it read to her instead right. of her reading it out loud. That's, right. I, that might even be better. I'm not yeah. really sure. I, I, but I would point out that built into Word is a lorem ipsum generator. So I mean, why <laughs> right, 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 right. what more could you possibly <laughs> ask? And every other feature. So. That's true. That is true. That's true. Oh, I love it. Actually, uh, to prove that nobody reads my articles, I use that sometimes as the body of the article. And, uh, <laughs> and nobody even... So, so I get compliments sometimes. So like that, you made some good points. Your Latin um, is excellent, uh, by the yeah, way. You're, yeah, you're right. Right. Um, I, I, you know, I want to do more AI coding. I mean, I, since I write in Lisp all the time, uh, there's a lot of right. there's a lot of material about AI coding in Lisp. Um, of course, it's probably not modern, but still, I think the general ideas sure. are probably the same. I'm thinking yeah. when you, when that, Richard, you that's talk the original expert language. Yeah, right. Like. Uh, when you talk about uh, big data sets, mm -hmm. that seems to be a little different than what a model is. I think a, I think of a model well, as less as the actual data and more as the connections. Uh, I think it's literally because it's in the name, right? L large language model. It's like an MMO to a, you know, a single player game or something. I mean, to be super simple. I feel right? like it's more than just a data set that there's, I don't know. I don't know. I have to do, I mean, that's why I mentioned I want to do more of this because I want to understand well, my, it better. My point being that you know, GPT-3 was substantially smaller and also yeah. did some useful work. But it was huge for its day. I mean, in, in its day was not long ago. I mean, right. <laughs> you know? last year. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, right. I mean, this is moving quick. Yeah, but part and part of this was that they changed the training design, and that made a huge difference for them as right. well. And they changed it in three, and then they redid it again in four. All the the good news is all of the technology being used for all of these LLMs is out there. It's open. It's public. It's a, it's in fact it's a handful of papers you can read. And yeah. if you can understand it, which I cannot, that's my biggest problem. <laughs> sure. Uh, Wait till they add quantum computing doing. to this. It's going <laughs> to get oof, exponentially worse. 
we can get errors faster than lightning. <laughs> it's you know? it's really an interesting world. It's a fascinating world. Yeah, yeah. it's crazy. And it's gonna it, it's coming soon in Windows twelve. Yeah, yeah. Soon in Windows twelve. You're Windows here. twelve. <laughs> so, well, yeah, it's coming today in Microsoft three sixty five Copilot, sort of, right? Some very yeah, specific yeah. features. This is not um, for uh, and this is not for me. It's for commercial users. Is no. that right? So this is, uh, I, I, I was t saying um, during your last uh, ad break, I actually looked this up again because I've been checking all day. Uh, to, to, to that moment, they have not yet <laughs> officially announced it. They did previously announce it would happen today. Okay. Um, I'm expecting and uh, would be surprised if there weren't some uh, new features discussed. And also having followed Microsoft 365 very closely as an organization for the past several years, if they don't spend every single month from here on out, piling on new features all the time, yeah. like again and again and again. Yeah. yeah, This is something they perfected is not the right word, but they piled it on with Microsoft 365. Um, Teams is maybe the poster child for this incredible, probably three-ish year run, right? New feature, new feature, new feature, it's incredible. Yeah. Um, I think you're gonna see that in Microsoft 365 Copilot, but tied to that is gonna be its expansion to uh, different customers, including consumers, right? Which they kind of previewed at uh, that September event. Yeah, so quite, quite possibly as Microsoft Copilot. Yeah, right. There, yeah, there you go. Mm. Um, so there's that. Uh, uh, the original version of Teams. If you, uh, I someone had to point this out to me. I actually do keep a Microsoft commercial account on uh, on hand for testing purposes. And uh, if you go into the admin, God, uh, you would think the uh, the messaging. Uh, what's it called? Admin messaging center or whatever would be the simplest thing in the world to find. It's not. It's uh, thirteen levels deep. Um, I'll give you a clue. I think it's under help. And then you, you go, it's just, it's way down there. Um, Why nobody can find it? Because whoever looks at help. Right. And when I look today to find it, I encountered the same thing I always do when I go to this admin center, which is like, come on, how is this not like a, a star thing up at the corner or some obvious, you know, whatever it's not. Anyway, you can find it. It's in there. But uh, there were four announcements yesterday. And one of them is that uh, now that the new version of Teams is out, the OG version, the old version, the Electron version, will be officially retired on the 31st. So anyone who has not switched over by then will be switched over. Um, this is a mostly good news thing. It's not like the new Outlook where you can complain for hours on end about all the stuff it doesn't do, because honest to God, that app is not there. Uh, but the new Teams actually solved a lot of problems, actually solved every problem I had with Teams. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's it is half, half the resources, yeah. yeah. Twice as fast, half as much uh, disk space, half, uh, RAM rather. Yeah, um, so they, big, and big they really did move away from Electron, a, a stack that nominally they own. Like, yeah, yeah. there's an interesting dynamic going on in there too. Yeah, so that's cool. Uh, or good, I should say. It's it's not bad news. I don't. I, I'd be surprised if any of us heard from anyone who was upset about that. No, um, I think the new team's kind of just the end, people win. just want software to work and preferably not eating up all your resources. In the yep, which is why they don't like the new outlook. Um, <laughs> so right. Uh, it's up all it, your resources and it doesn't do what you exactly. want. Exactly. This is kind of the opposite of what I was looking for. Did you yes. we, did you look at this in a mirror or something? Or what, what? four <laughs> threads, none of them for you. Yeah, exactly. Nice. Uh yeah. Oh no, that's file explorer, Richard. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, <laughs> none of them for none, none of them for file copy. Um uh, none of them for you. <laughs> Uh, and then I talked about the the whole word thing. Yeah, uh, the, the, you want to talk about earnings? Because I can make fun of earnings. Yeah, I, I only uh, ha have two companies in here, and, and it's because they relate in some way to what we talked about previously with Microsoft, right? So <laughs> Amazon just announced their Q3 earnings, um, obviously. Well, maybe not obviously, if you don't know this. Um, even though they aren't the biggest company in big tech, they always have the most revenues, <laughs> right? So they always outpace Apple, for example. Well, be, yeah, because they're a warehousing company. Yeah, no, they're they're very different from every other company. They 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 have a gigantic physical Margins presence. Are tight. I believe they have. I and I only know this because I think Brad looked this up. They actually have over a million employees. Yeah. Most of them are driving trucks oh, and working yeah. in warehouses and stuff. But big, right? Um, One hundred forty three billion dollars. Blah blah blah. Whatever. So the the problem for Microsoft uh, is that Amazon has this little thing called AWS, and Never. AWS has been kicking ass, frankly, for a long time. They are the original. Yep. And so as Microsoft kind of came up with Windows Azure and then Azure and exploded out the number of services and things you can do with Azure, uh, obviously they've got the, their eye on this one thing. And that one thing is AWS. And, and Amazon has done a comparable job uh, expanding the capabilities of AWS. And they, for whatever reason, they, they, they have a very loyal uh, user base out in the world of developers, and um, it's very popular. Mm -hmm. So Microsoft, because they couldn't really compete, invented something that they used to call the, the commercial cloud. 
And I think now they call it the Microsoft Cloud. Microsoft Cloud or Commercial Cloud or whatever they're calling it these days is not a real thing. Not intelligent cloud? No, that's a real thing. That's an actual business. This is a made up thing. And what it is, is they cherry pick, they never tell you what, you know, what comprises it, but they cherry pick the best businesses across Microsoft. Most of them are in intelligent cloud and in productivity and online services, I think is the name of it. Um, To present a thing that, like I said, is made up, (laughs) is an aggregate of things that they don't tell you what they are that competes with AWS. And okay. But Microsoft Cloud is never really, I'm not sure that they've ever surpassed the revenues for AWS. Mm-hmm. They did this quarter. So based on the current set of measures, which are still somewhat opaque. Well, let's put it this way. So let's look at, so the way, what I did was I looked at some actual real numbers. So for example, AWS uh, came in at $31.8 billion in revenues. Okay. Uh, Intelligent Cloud, that thing that you just mentioned, which is basically the Azure, right? And some a few other things. Uh, including some server things, by the way, uh, 24.3 billion. Okay. Uh, so just that one part of Microsoft, actually, it's pretty close. I mean, 24 versus 31. Oh, I'm sorry. So I don't, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. I, 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 I read you wrong. Sorry, sorry. Uh, AWS was 23. Yeah. The invented business that Microsoft has, Microsoft Cloud, was 31.8. But the right. actual business that Microsoft has, Intelligent yeah. Cloud, was 24.3, which is more than AWS. And I think that mm-hmm. is... The first, time. the first time, I yeah. think so. Yeah, I, if so, that is notable. Uh, yeah. So I, you know, I, I'm speculating there in a way. I didn't bother to look it up. I'm lazy, but I believe that is the first time. And I, my memory is obviously fantastic. So why wouldn't That's you tell me? Interesting. <laughs> but also, something we should expect. Like they, yeah, I think they have punted on their platform play. They largely do this as a third party, meaning Amazon, where Microsoft is all in on the platform and is also driving business. Yes. Right. So revenue is a revenue. conversation on run as that you will save money getting off of IaaS and moving to PAP. Yeah. Um, I, we would have talked about this last week, but Microsoft has a roughly um, 10 billion, you know, per quarter spend on AI infrastructure build up that's only going to go up over time, et cetera, et cetera. We all kind of understand that. Um, but th- they also had an unexpectedly strong quarter with regards to AI adoption, uh, uh, AI services adoption running on Azure from third parties. And this is the thing. This is like um, in gaming, we would compare this to uh, game streaming where Microsoft has this business that they sell it to consumers and it makes some money or not, but they can also sell it to companies like Sony that can use it in their own services. And if Sony beats Microsoft in that game, so to speak, Microsoft still sort of wins, right? Cause they're getting, yeah. you know, revenue. From Sony. Uh, and so Microsoft's kind of doing the, fir- the same thing. They're going to have first party. Well, they do already now have first party AI services that are paid uh, that run on their own infrastructure, but they're also going to have a lot of third party. And uh, I bet the third party, well, I shouldn't say that. I think both are going to be very good businesses. I'll just say well, that. Yeah, open AI runs on Azure, right? Like yep. they're, they're out right. There. That's a great example. So there's as AI becomes more and more of a thing, as everyone uh, adopts AI as table stakes and needs to implement AI, only a couple of companies are going to turn to, and one of them yeah. is Microsoft. And I think you they're get realizing double whammy where you're both the gold panner yeah. and the guy selling the shovels. Yeah, exactly. Right. Right. And uh, right. I don't. And that's an interesting. That's a good way to put it. It's a. It's an interesting business model. But I think it's working out for them. Yeah. No, um, for them. Yeah. Or, and I think it will long term too. I think uh, you know Microsoft is all one of the few companies that can make this kind of investment, and I think it's gonna. I think that investment is gonna pay off. Yeah. But today it's just revenues. I mean, we're not. No, no one's saying it's profitable. We did it. You know, it's we're not there yet. No, no. It's just it's you know what's funny is like I spent a whole bunch of money on the front end. I kept a bunch of it, and I'm going to show it as revenue. In the meantime, yeah. I don't right. know if the thing I spent the money on actually made money. Yeah. Right. My. We can suspect it probably didn't, mm-hmm. but you know, but, but, but you know, we'll get, it's it an, that's 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 an investment, right? It's not uh, the idea is you don't get paid back right away. Yeah. Um, and then the other one is Intel for obvious reasons, right? So Intel is kind of the bellwether or is a bellwether of the PC industry. Remember last uh, week, I guess it was Microsoft said, "Hey, we saw a little upswing in Windows license sales to PC makers." That indicates that mm-hmm. things are probably going to start getting better. Intel confirmed that. Uh, and so they had uh, you know 14.2 billion in revenues uh, in the same quarter. That's a decline of 8% year over year, but looking to the future, they see the same trends that Microsoft spoke of. And uh, they're- And they were profitable. Which they is, were profitable. They're not and always also, profitable. Right? Uh, and the, P, the the part of the business that is responsible for PCs, the client computing group, 
did see a decline. All of my, all of their major businesses did, but it was the smallest decline at Intel. Actually, it was only three percent. And uh, and you know they they're starting to do the AI MPU stuff and blah 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 whatever. Um, they believe that the PC buying slump is coming to a close. So. Yeah. Uh, they expect to see growth in the PC market in this quarter, shock. the one we're in right now. Yeah. So the shock waves of the pandemic are uh, are finally the, the, the yeah the tsunami that disrupted everything has you know we've hit the other side of it. Or, we can, uh, so we can get back whatever to the metaphor is scheduled yeah. decline of civilization. Okay, or of the PC, you know, exactly the plateauing of the PC market. You know, what? I would yeah. I would embrace a plateau at this point. I. It's, uh, it's in the neighborhood of 250 million machines per year could like could be replaced when, i mean yeah. yeah and i'm sort of telegraphing like this week's run as we're talking about keeping your pcs for longer right like they oh, turn oh, like oh, slowing oh, nice. down okay. i should look ahead and see what that is uh yeah. cool that's great um <laughs> and, and this speaks to your next story right that, I, I was i was literally just like paused yeah. on the on the segue that I, I I'm trying not to be snarky. Um, and is. speaking of PCs, you're not going to hold on to any longer. Yeah. Uh, Microsoft service. No. Um, so, <laughs> uh, surface as a business like Apple, right. Has kind of gone kicking and screaming in some ways into the, that whole repairable right to repair, uh, right to repair thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, that said, uh, you know, whatever the motivation is, I guess we can just kind of overlook that because it has gotten so much better. And uh, Microsoft, I think back, I don't know, May timeframe, maybe we're, we're talking about this and uh, that the latest Microsoft Surface devices have, generally speaking, incredible uh, numbers of parts that could be repaired or replaced. Um, they partnered with iFixit. So there's another outlet for getting this stuff. They have everything that Surface has that you can get to be replaced. Uh, can be bought from iFixit, which may be a little more convenient for a lot of people, right? right. Here's the thing I think is most interesting about uh, this. The earliest Surface that can be repaired in any way, shape, or form is the Surface Pro 7. Um, that device has one repairable part, <laughs> kickstand. <laughs> That's it. You can replace the kickstand. Everything else you screwed. And re I, I think most people will sort of remember Microsoft at some point on Surface Pro, probably the next one, moved to a, a little SSD module type thing, right? So you could kind of swap that out. Um, if you flash forward to the latest Surface Pro, which is the five, uh, the nine, sorry, 5G, which is the Qualcomm one, um, there are 13 parts that can be replaced in that. And that includes the entire motherboard. Uh, it's basically everything. Um, yeah, as, it, as it should be. Yep, as, exactly. But it, but again, uh, this is something I don't think they wanted to do necessarily. I I, I think we're at the point now where we could say, you well, know, what, I don't care why, the, but the EU has been pushing on this yeah. for repairability, right? Like we they yeah. want replaceable batteries and smartphones, and so and it's not just a like a part in a bag, right? You have to yeah. also have guides that explain exactly how this works, videos, yeah. you know, uh, facts that explain, you know, common questions, etc. So it's and all out there. It's not just on the Microsoft. That it's possible, not that it's easy. Like you're still going to yeah. need some specific tools. Oh, and by the way, not that it's necessarily ex inexpensive, right? Yeah. If you had to replace, I don't know, I don't know exactly, but I bet a Surface Pro Nine motherboard probably costs more than a Surface Pro Nine, <laughs> you know, or something. Yeah. Uh, that's that's that way in the Google Apple Google. world. Don't uh, don't yeah. screw up your motherboard. You'll be sorry. Yeah, but you know what? I, I, again, I, nothing's ever going to be perfect. It's not like everything's going to turn into a framework laptop, but. I still think that's, I, I this is laudable. I, I just, I, I, I also know. see this as this is the next thing you market, right? You, you can't market faster chips. That has been true for a while. Yeah. And you know, there's you, why yeah. would you buy a new machine? This right. is the machine you'll be able to keep for longer because you can change the battery. Off. And honestly, Break what you just, prepared. that mirror is the way Microsoft sort of marketed uh, surface in the beginning. Hmm. The idea was we are a trusted brand. Yep. At the time, you could go to a store and and swap things out and get Good things up. fixed. They had whatever their version, of and they Genius were very Star generous was. with that too. Like, they were very yes, they were, and um, and it, it, it and honestly, it is Microsoft. I mean, I, I I will hear now from everyone who's been screwed by them on Surface, but <laughs> uh, they've done honestly. I think they do do a good job, but the reality is they're also an unknown in the PC space. They don't sell very many computers, and you are taking it's like buying a Pixel. I, Google makes the platform just like Microsoft makes the platform, but sure. Pixel is still right. a little bit iffy for right. some people. Uh, it's not a known brand, right? They don't sell very many of them. Um, so they're in the same place. So I, I think this will help um, uh, with some people's fears that this thing may be a dead end or you know something's going to go wrong and I can't get Absolutely. it fixed. I mean, you'll be able to get it fixed. I think that's good. Let's do some like Xbox to. kids. I just love that we're three quarters of the way through the show before we talk about Xbox. What a it's, good day. It's hour three. That means it's Xbox time. 
Uh, yeah. Well, um, there is some Xbox news. So there's this um, is actually after, a big segment. I'm looking at what you got here. Yeah, this stuff this is to talk one. about. I have an exciting announcement it's to make. It's the big that's one. Be so vague, you're gonna go nuts, <laughs> but you're gonna love it. All right. So Microsoft announced its acquisition of Activision Blizzard. I think we covered that story. We did. We? I Maybe believe we did. We did. Yeah, we, we touched on briefly, it. Yeah. Briefly mentioned. Oh, briefly. Okay. So um, not uh, long thereafter, uh, Satya Nadella contact, or contacted everybody and talked about this big um, reorg. Mm -hmm. And I think for most people, this doesn't mean too, too much. Um, there's a whole group of people under um, Phil Spencer. I will say, here's my key takeaway to this. And, and honestly, I think it was tied to this. Um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Bethesda. Mm -hmm. has remained its own sort of separate company. They, they treat it like, it, I don't know what you call this. It's, it is a, yeah, okay. I was, yeah, sorry, I, I meant in the, in the terms of like studio. So Microsoft has first pr party studios. These are the studios they own and they do own Bethesda. And then mm -hmm. there are third party studios like uh, Activision used to be out in the world that, you know, and they, there are different rules and different accountings and different things that go on in, in there. But you, yes, you can, you can, uh, they do this with Mojang, right? I think, yeah. uh, and with LinkedIn, right? And LinkedIn and GitHub. And GitHub. Okay, good. So, yeah, uh, Bethesda is treated like that. Uh, Activision Blizzard is not going to be treated like that. They're coming into Microsoft. Like, they will be part of Microsoft, uh, well, rather, I guess, Xbox Studios. Like, they're actually going to be... Including I'm sorry? Including Bobby Kotick? Yeah, until the end of the year when he leaves, yeah. So, for oh. a brief period of time, that little cancer will spread around Microsoft. Two more months, Just wondering, like, does, does he we immediately had, get ejected for HR violations? Like, isn't that listen, how Microsoft absorbed Mark West for a period of time, right? Was that the guy, the the yep. The, yep. the campaign manager guy, that guy who would like Penn, disappear Mark and Penn. Solfer, Mark, Mark Penn, I'm Penn. Sorry. Yeah, Mark West was the uh, the the center for the Phoenix Suns back then. It doesn't matter. The point is, <laughs> <laughs> uh, they they do things differently for different people um, at different companies, whatever. So uh, that was very interesting. So the bad news, the blue badge. That's interesting. Yep. So he's going to always have that. He'll probably have it uh, like pinned up on his little cork board when he does Zoom calls in the future. You know, you'll see that. So he's <laughs> he's getting it. Uh, he's also getting the biggest golden parachute parachute in the history of mankind, if I'm not mistaken. Well, he was um, there for decades. I mean, he's yeah. one of the founders. He's one of the founders. He, so. so no, no, he wasn't one of the founders. He was well. He days came in early, like for the yeah. early nineties. Yeah. yeah. I mean, remember Activision came out of Atari, right? Dan right. Crane and those guys. Uh, but he he has been there for thirty years. He's run the company for a long darn. He time. is almost certainly the guy there the longest right yeah. now. I you know, uh, I bet I don't know that for a fact. But it makes sense, right? It's been around forever. Um, as part of this reorg, though, they're also reorging mark uh, marketing. Uh -oh. And uh, there's a there's a bunch of, yeah, there's a bunch of marketing occurring under the Xbox org, and unexpectedly, Chris Capicella, who I not from a technical perspective, but from a communications perspective, remember this is my primary issue with this company, was one of the uh, most credible human beings Ugh. and nicest people I've ever known in my entire don't, life. Don't leaving tell. Oh, Microsoft. he's leaving. Ugh. We love now, Chris. We don't know. Yes, we do. So we don't know what this means. Uh, and we may never know what it means, although I'm going to try to find out privately. But um, this is a weird comparison. But I think his leaving was similar to Panos Panay's uh -huh. in the sense that there were reorgs and changes. Money was shifting in different directions. And I'm going to say one of two things here. Either he was offered a position that either he may be perceived or was a demotion, like instead of CMO, but he would, might have been CMO of some other part of Microsoft or as a credible human being and i'd like i'm leaning in this direction i don't you know i don't have any just knowing him so well uh that he was not interested in uh you know he could always defend microsoft's behavior somewhat um i don't i think there's some indefensible things that maybe need to happen when it comes to marketing and ai and whatever else is going uh, coming down the pike and maybe this was just the ethical break he couldn't do it i don't know i don't know i want to be clear the acquisition of activision blizzard uh, not just no no but this uh, no no i'm not necessarily activision blizzard but rather the ai stuff that this is actually tied to a bigger thing because i think that i this is not the only reorg we're going to see i think that um there's going to be more of this and it's no, going to have a lot I, to and, I, and i don't disagree with you i suspect he was being squeezed on roll and yeah I, that, that's the obvious that that's the panel spinet comparison yeah yeah and yep. i and it's not like he doesn't he needs any more money right like what, what it's we, not like any of these people need any more money. I mean, uh, you know. Well, and yes, he would be right. hired if he wants to do this instantly right. by a, any of a dozen, red, you know, blue chip companies. I mean, he was really yeah. good at his job. 
You have is, uh, you I have a count. You said yeah, he's I been do. on Windows yeah, yeah, yeah. six times at the wow. uh, in our uh, year-end episodes. Is it six uh, or at least six? Twenty twenty-one. Okay. Twenty twenty. Twenty nineteen. Twenty seventeen. Twenty sixteen. I'll do some searching. At least six. At least six. I'd say at least six. So here's the thing. I just I'm gonna, I'm just going to say two sentences side by side. I'm going to let it hang there in the air. Chris Capicella has left the building. Actually, three things. Yes. Has left the building. He's leaving yes. Microsoft. Yes. We have had Chris Capicella on several times to do a year-end show on Windows Weekly. Most notably, this year, not last year. Right, and we don't know why, but okay. this year, we are going to have a special guest on the holiday show at the end of the year. Uh-huh. That's all I'm going to say. It's going to be a surprise for everybody. It's going to be amazing. Uh-huh. Okay. okay. No, I don't want to see any speculation in Discord. <laughs> Talk to yourself. <laughs> huh. Captain Obvious over there. You know who you are. Huh. <laughs> so... Huh. Yeah, we'll well you did kind of put, special guest. put the two things in juxtaposition. I sure did. I put them right there next to each other. It's true. Whew. So you can draw your um, conclusions as you will, you know. Living large. Chris has we'll been see. on, I have the official yep. score here many, many times. Um, one, two, th- three, Four, five, six, seven, seven, I thought eight it was seven. Windows Weekly appearances oh, starting oh, okay. December twenty third, twenty fifteen. Okay, it, it, was, it was the last show of the year for many, many years. Okay, I cannot promise the same number of years going forward, but we are going to have a guest. And and, and do you want to tell uh, the well, you 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 email Kevin King and give him whatever he needs to know. Kevin's not finding out to the last minute because that guy, <laughs> oh yeah, that guy, <laughs> he's going to he's going to stress over this for two months. I mean, he, he is. He's a bothered. stress I case. He, he, and he I don't want him. Deeply. No, no, I don't, don't. There's no need to stress. The last Windows Weekly of the year is December twentieth. I just want you to know, okay. the twenty seventh will be okay. a best of. Okay. So I wanted to be I, again. I can't. I, ha- I have to beg you not to guess. No guessing. I understand why you're guessing. No guessing. Uh, but a special I, I, guest I will like join us. Santa I, I Claus. I think it's Santa Kevin Claus. Is it Santa Claus? Emailed me. Is it Santa Claus? No. I can tell you it's not Santa Claus. But anyway, it will be special, and you will love it. I, that, this like December twentieth. Okay. All right. December twentieth. All right. There you go. I'll even be I'll, home. I'll, I will tell Richard in case something happens to me, um, but uh, that will be the only person until, okay. until we get close. I, mean, I think okay. we're just talking about how well I keep secret. There you go. Right. It is going to be Bobby Kotick, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> that um, would be hysterical. <laughs> you know what? I'm, that's my guess. Uh, oh, you've you, been cast as Satan in the general press, but surely you have some positive qualities. <laughs> Could you perhaps? How about April first? <laughs> Let's see. Give the us blue a badge. list of, of your hidden gems, Bobby. Um, <laughs> so we'll see. About that. Um, and then, okay, so there's more Xbox. So uh, there's an Xbox October update uh, out. This one, uh, this is interesting because we have keyboard mapping now coming to controllers, and they've added this now for the series. I'm sorry for the. Um, Elite Series 2, and uh, what's the accessibility control, the adaptive controller, right? And uh, this is another one of those things, you know, as we do game streaming and uh, different games on different platforms, uh, the ability to play uh, with a keyboard and mouse, right? Like we did on the Dreamcast. Oh, I ago. like it's that. Great, yeah, yeah, I liked it too. I used to play Quake 3, D, uh, Quake 3, sorry, Arena on the Dreamcast using a keyboard and mouse. It was great. And, and the Dreamcast was running in Windows Mobile? Windows CE. Uh, not, CE. It wasn't, it was one of the operating environments, uh, yeah. but not not by default, but yeah, it could. Um, and then there's also um, tied to uh, Xbox's ability to back up screenshots and videos to OneDrive. You can use ClipChamp to import them directly from the app and uh, edit them in ClipChamp and then publish them that way, which is, you know, not a bad way to do it. ClipChamp, as we know, is a great app. Talk about that a lot. And that's pretty much the big news in that update. Um, what else we got here? Oh, yeah, so a new month, new month of Xbox Game Pass. Uh, back in the day, this would also be a new month of Xbox Games with Gold, but that is gone. Um, so for the first half of the month, several new games I, we're getting into that weird territory until activision comes on board it's like what are these things i don't recognize any of these games I'm in the like, i haven't heard of any of them. thirsty I, I feel, suitors I, I feel so out of touch uh, wild hearts was games. pretty pretty popular wild hearts okay that one yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. thirsty and course, suitors know, and the man who erased his name yeah. wow that's too bad <laughs> we can tell you his name but we can't because he erased it 
<laughs> and Spirit um, Tea and Coral Island. Wow, these are just weird. I know, yeah, I know. They're, we're at, I think, the bottom of the barrel officially. Well, we're about to be at the top of the barrel because Activision Blizzard is coming on board. There's going to be some good stuff in there. A lot of titles there. Yep. Um, this one is not an official report, although I guess there's a support page out there that kind of suggests it's true. But Microsoft is going to crack down on the use of unofficial Xbox controllers. People were upset about this. Second. Oh, yeah, I, I'm trying gosh. to understand like what the market is here, because I believe these the, uh, typically there's two reasons you would buy an un unofficial Xbox. Actually, three. One, you didn't know it was unofficial. Two, it's cheap, right? They're not paying for the license. <laughs> that could be why. But the big reason, I think, is they have controllers that let you cheat. Cheat device. And, oh. Uh, I yeah, my Auto son, player. who is to this day the best Call of Duty player that's ever existed and could blow anyone out of the water, uh, the guy who got two nukes in one uh, <laughs> online game of, uh, I think it was Call of Duty 4, um, wanted so badly one Christmas as a kid to get one of those controllers. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You're already better than everybody. What do you need this for? Like, you don't even need it. I yeah. need it just to play with you. <laughs> um, so those are a thing. And I think they're trying to crack down on, I, I think that's probably the motivation here, right? Interesting. Um, so, that would be the only reasonable approach. And why would they bother otherwise? Except yeah, right. Well, damaging play for others. I, if, if there was some uh, knockoff selling $20 Xbox controllers and the official ones were 60 bucks, I, maybe that would be a problem too. But mm -hmm. I do think it's, I think it's cheating uh, pretty much. Interesting. Okay. So there weren't, yeah. there and, weren't like, so, you know, in some, some devices, there's story. better controllers, right? You know, they do more. Yeah. Oh no, you can, you're right. You could, you might specifically go to buy an expensive controller right. that's better. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Controller. But yeah, yep. anti-cheat, I understand. That's different. Yeah. And I linked to the wrong thing here, so I'm going to fix that. So Atari, the company we all think we know, but we I think we need to acknowledge that the Atari that exists today is not the Atari <laughs> that existed when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I completely screwed up this link. Sorry, let me just, I'll just paste it in rather than trying to be cute with it, um, is buying Digital Eclipse. Now, if there's anyone out there who is an Amiga fan from back in the day, you might understand that when I heard that name, I thought of the company that made the pinball game. It was so fantastic on the Amiga that would scroll up and down with the screen. You know, it was amazing. And that company I thought was called Digital Eclipse, but it wasn't because Digital Eclipse started in the early 90s. They uh, created this incredible emulator technology that they could actually read the source code in from an original arcade what? game and then spit it out native code on a oh new machine God. and whatever. So you might be thinking, okay, I mean, I, we know Atari's into retro games now and all that kind of stuff, but here, you know this company. This company just published that Karateka International uh, uh, International Interactive Documentary. That's the technology they used to do it. And they uh, worked with the guy who created the original game oh, to make this happen. So there might be more yeah. of these. No, there will be more oh, of these. They've already great. announced one that's supposed to happen in December, yeah. I think. But Atari yeah, ramped up. Yep. And it's going to be coming through Atari now. Yeah. That's, that's neat. Awesome. So yeah, I like I, I they're docu games. I, they're do both documentaries yeah, and games. Play, yeah, there are actual games in there. You can play different versions of the game, and then there are interactive documentaries about the making of the games and uh, whatever. It's, it's a big package of good, stuff. If you're into this stuff, it's amazing. Category. It's really clever. Yeah, that yeah. Karate, Karateka thing was a masterpiece. It's unbelievable. Um, so that's really actually really neat. And I, I really have to say this this Atari, as we'll call it, the post infogrames Atari, whatever they are. Um, uh, has tried, you know, modern, semi-modern consoles. We've tried a few different things, but they're just embracing what they are, which is their Atari and their Centipede and Pac-Man, and we're going to do retro gaming. And they have been on a little buying spree, buying up uh, the rights to, or existing companies that are actually still doing things, uh, to, to these games that have been sitting dormant for decades. Nice. Uh, Microprose, I think it was one of them, and a bunch, they, they own now a lot of this stuff. And they're going to the fan base and saying, hey, what do you want to see? <laughs> you know, I mean, a bunch of micro stuff showed up on Steam like that used to be where old games went. <laughs> went to, uh, old, for a uh, old games went to die or a good old game. What is it called? Uh, God, good old God, games. Right? Good, Gog. Good, yeah. Good old games. Gog. Yeah. Gog. Sorry. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, anyway, I, that's nothing but good news. So that's neat. Nice. Yeah. OK. Um, and then. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. You can rest. You don't have to. Is there anything else? Do a few. We do some push-ups. Do some push-ups. We're going to do uh, your <laughs> tips and picks of the week, uh, and an app of the week, and a brown liquor of the week. But before we do all that, I do want to make a plea. You mentioned earlier that uh, your ad sales on uh, Thorot.com are down. That's why everybody should join Thorot Premium to support what 
what you read on therot.com. And this is true across the board. And I don't know why uh, many podcast networks have gone under. Gimlet's gone. WNYC is returning, which was a big studio. It's going back to the radio. <laughs> they said, if it can't be a radio show, we don't want to do it, which certainly is future forward. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to go back to the radio. I'm making a plea to you. I would like to keep doing what we do, but we need your help to do it. Um, I always thought the Twit could be an ad, a, a listener-supported network. Uh, I, it turned out it really couldn't, and all of our growth has occurred with the help of uh, of advertising. But that the, that era is gone from podcasting, for blogs, for a lot of things, which means we got to turn back to you. And I don't mind that at all. I think that's really exciting. That's why we created Club Twit. It's two years old now. Lisa was prescient. She had a feeling. Uh, she also did a lot of research and said, you know, we're not going to make this expensive. We want to make it available to the largest number of people possible. $7 a month. And that price hasn't changed. $84 a year. There's not a discount for a year. It's just, just a convenience. So you get billed once a year instead of 12 times. There's, there are discounts for family memberships and corporate memberships. You can go to the website twit.tv slash club twit and read all about it. Pick what you want. You can even buy individual shows. But let me tell you what the $7 membership gets you. It gets you ad-free versions of this show. No ads. You wouldn't even hear this. Club Twit members don't even know I'm begging, uh, which is probably a good thing. Uh, <laughs> you get uh, shows we don't put out anywhere else, like Paul's Hands on Windows. We put out little sample versions, but they, he does that every, every week. Hands on Macintosh with Micah Sargent, The Untitled Linux Show with Jonathan Bennett, The Giz Fizz with Dick D. Bartolo. Scott Wilkinson's Home Theater Geeks. You know, the plan is to bring these shows out in the club where the club members are paying for them, and then as they grow, perhaps, release them into the public. That's what happened to This Week in Space. Uh, but we want to make sure you get your $7 worth. You also get access to the Discord, which is, I think, what I think in, in you know, we were talking about how, you know, social networks seem to be dying. Discord is growing. Discord is amazing. And because our Discord is just people who are members of Club Twit, it's a pretty darn good group. Uh, we are now at 7,985 paid members. If 15 more of you join, I will, I will, um, I don't know, what should I do? I will stand on my head and fall over immediately. <laughs> Uh, we would love to get to 8,000 members today. You want to help out? Twit.tv slash Club Twit. 8,000 sounds like a lot. We have approximately 700,000 unique listeners every month. So that means, you know, about a little more than 1% of you are members. I'd like to get that higher. Honestly, if we got to five or even, we were hoping 10%, 70,000 members, uh, our, the future would be assured. We'd be able to launch new shows. We'd be able to do a whole lot more. Uh, and we'd like to. What we don't want to do is have to cut shows, cut hosts. Uh, but, you know, yeah. we, don't, we don't have venture capital. So without, absent your funding, uh, we might have to. Twit.tv slash Club Twit. This is not a threat. I don't want to blackmail you. I just want to be clear about the situation we're in. And a lot of, very actually, a lot of companies are in. So many podcast networks have disappeared this year. Uh, because of this. We don't want to be one of them. Twit.tv slash Club Twit. All right. Back of the book coming up. Paul Therott, kick us off with the back of the book, if you will. Well, this is a threat. You better buy my damn book. No. <laughs> um, no. uh, I, I don't remember when. Some time ago, I, I mentioned I would be updating the book for 23H2. I've been working on that diligently here in Mexico. Um, based on the schedule nonsense we talked about early in the show, I thought I would have until November. I had it until yesterday. Uh, so uh, I, I actually got to the minimum of what I wanted to get done. I got done. So I've, uh, two of the new chapters are in there for Copilot and Windows Backup. It's 160 pages of new slash updated content. Most of it is updated, right, obviously. Um, with rare exceptions, every single screenshot is brand new. Um, I retested everything, especially all the workaround stuff for the setup nonsense and all that kind of stuff. 950 page, actually it's 951 is the official page length right now. It's about 150,000 words. It's a lot of stuff. It's gonna get bigger because um, there's a lot more new content to come and I'm gonna update the whole thing for the book. But, but the first, Mm, I bet it's for the first 12 chapters-ish are updated. Also, I, I'm kind of cherry-picking the ones 
where it makes the most sense. Like OneDrive, I updated because that's changing in this release. So if you have already purchased the book, uh, go to LeanPub. You can get the update for free, and I'll be updating chapter by chapter going forward, not in one big batch like this. Um, if you don't have it, please do consider buying it. it it's nine ninety nine and up. You could pay more if you'd like. Um, I think it's a good reference, but I would. I wrote it, um, so maybe that's not fair. He even uses um, it himself. He actually has to I go to the it, book. I, I literally I looked up something today. I was like, I know you can do this. <laughs> I can't. I can't hold everything in my no, head. No, that's I mean, a lot of pages. As, as, as big as it is. If this book were um, in print, in print, how many pages would it be? Well, that's it. It's it's nine hundred and fifty in PDF form. So it's that's how big it is. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. You can't I told you this story. I've, I've told this story today, but I still love this so much. Um, the second to last print book I wrote was the Windows 7, no, uh, Windows 7 Secrets. And uh, I was out in the Netherlands. I appeared at the Windows 7 launch there, and we had a little table. People could go over and get the book signed or whatever. And this guy, <laughs> the, the Dutch, as Richard knows this very well, are so blunt. We, we, we were so copacetic, like immediately on each other's same page. And this guy said, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He goes, if Windows 7 is so easy to use, why did you need 750 pages to describe it? <laughs> good, good question. And, yeah. And I said, well, I padded it with screenshots. Um, <laughs> but it was, that's, that's good. I like, I like cutting to the chase. Um, yep. And then the uh, the app pick is related, right, to Windows 11 and, and 23H2, although it doesn't require 23H2, which is that Stardock has released a major new version of Start 11, which they're calling Start 11 V2. Um, this is not an expensive product on the best of days. So the next, the, the normal price is six ninety nine. It, it was I don't know if it still is right now, but at launch was on sale for five ninety nine. If you bought it I, again, I don't know what the time frame is, but if you already own the first one, you could get it for as little as I think two or three dollars on upgrade. Like seriously, guys, throw them your money. Oh, this is what start, I want my start, start menu to look like. This yes, is fantastic. Start eleven is amazing. Um, and it is a huge disappointment in my life. Just like I can't use a Mac or Chrome OS or Windows 10 because I have to write about stock of Windows 11. I'm writing a book, you know. I want to use this thing so bad, and I can't. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> right? Because I have. Yeah. To, I can't. But yeah. you should, and definitely look at this. Um, I really, my really particular, uh, I particularly enjoy the fact that this screenshot of it is on a MacBook. So, uh, well done. <laughs> yeah, well, well done. This is, yeah. yeah. Sure. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> is that not a MacBook? Uh, like, that indentation uh, looks very familiar there. I, that is definitely know, a MacBook. I hate to tell you. It's hard to say. I know. I know exactly what this is. It could be a Surface Lab. <laughs> might be a Surface Lab. It's a MacBook. Uh, because people who do graphics um, use Mac. Yep. All right. Very nice pick of the week. Yeah. Now it's turn uh, t time to turn to Richard Campbell for the Run As Radio. Uh, this week's show, coincidentally, with all the conversations we were having about things, was with Mike Halsey, who uh, has written a book all called The Green IT. Oh, I do know Mike. Okay, I was wondering if I had noticed. By I the way, Mike. I love your 404 page. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> so we, uh, we are having a problem with the website. So it turned up to It looks like the underlying APIs changed. This is freaking awesome. How'd you yeah. like that? We worked really hard. Uh, there it Our is. Our whole website is filled <laughs> with uh, IT gags. Like you notice those underscores; those are yeah. all keys that. Yeah, sure. That's menu menu uh, shortcuts. You, you gotta love a, a website that's made out of basically ASCII art. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. No, this is we were, we were headed down that path. It's a gorgeous well, website. And, then, yeah. and all those colors; those are the metro colors. Yeah. Nice, nice. From you know, winning. Sure. Okay, so. But yeah, something happening on the API layer and uh, bad things. The site's a little busted right now. But if you are subscribed to the show, it downloaded normally. The RSS feed is fine. It's just the front the front end is a little mangled at the moment. Anyway, we were talking uh, green IT. So I mean, part of this conversation was about keeping PCs for longer and then also repurposing them when you've got to move them on and or going through better recycling process and trying to keep them out of landfills. Um, and we talked more broadly than that because there's lots of different bits and pieces of hardware. We did talk about right to repair, maintainability of equipment, battery replacements, that kind of thing. Mike Halsey so looks just, just like you, Richard. Yeah, you could be crazy. twins. Part of that broken website thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but at least it fails well. I mean, that's a good... That's it, a, it, it failed in an interesting way. Yeah. It's not actually... Is it actually... It is five... That's the 500th episode. It, the 500th episode is my has my headshot, but that yeah. tap is from episode 905. Okay. The right. real okay, problem... I was gonna, I was, okay, I was going to say, I thought you were past that. Okay, right. Yeah. But the real problem here is that it is showing the ad from the 500th show. Not yeah. the, oh, forget paid. that. 
So yeah, that's going to be a problem. But uh, yeah, no, this is the you're looking at my afternoon. It's fixing that. <laughs> Green IT with Mike Halsey. It is yeah. available now, and if you subscribe, you don't have to worry about the website at all. Yeah, everything. I don't worry about the website. No. Websites. Although, if you go click on listen, you would hear nine oh five. Oh, good. It's got my okay. The right. show is there. now. Let's liquor liquor up. Oh, he froze. Do you see oh, that? No. Oh no, freeze. He froze. I don't know anything about this, Ry? No, thank That's God. There we go. After all that. After two and a half hours, almost three hours, working perfect. Just to I had to talk about. I, food. I was vaguely hoping I'd have to do that tap dance thing that happens when like a speaker doesn't show up, and then the guy who's there has to talk about it, even though he has no idea. Yes, hand. Let me talk about dot net. You know. Exactly. And it's like, uh, are we done? Oh no, I have fifty-eight minutes left. Okay, uh, <laughs> you know, great. I have I've done a fill-in for a keynote like that once where we didn't know what? when he was going to arrive, and so I did a I, fifteen-minute story, then I did a ten-minute story. I did, I did oh, a Longhorn Lord. server keynote exactly like that, and I, I yes, I, that's just anyway. I have great Would confidence like in Rich's ability to fill. However, I could. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> It comes to be a professional alcoholic, I think. <laughs> uh, you want to talk about American rye whiskey? Oh, yes. rye whiskey, rye whiskey. So it is a category. American rye whiskey has specific guidelines around it. Its main thing is 51% rye. So this is a different kind of grain. It's been around a long time. It's not as popular as it used to be for a variety of reasons. Most American rye is going to also have corn and barley in it as well. Again, the barley provides some amylase, which decreases the methanol bounce. Corn is an inexpensive grain. Uh, similar to American bourbon, it must be distilled no higher than 80% ABV and barreled at no more than 62.5%. So that part is similar. It, it needs to be aged in American oak. Uh, it's a minimum aging. If you minimum, if you age it for at least two years, you're allowed to call it straight rye whiskey as long as it has no blending in it. But it's not particularly popular. It's having a resurgence now. But the original rye whiskeys weren't from Kentucky. They were from the Northeast, New York, Maryland, Pennsylvania, the areas where they grow or they used to grow a lot of rye. Uh, what took out rye whiskey for the most part was prohibition. So during Prohibition, most distilleries in the Northeast closed down and rye consumption went down and a lot of farmers planted wheat. Uh, they switched to, to, to modern grains. Now, I remember it's the 20s, it's in the 30s that all of this goes down. And that's also when the engineering of, of grains started to change. And one of the things that we discovered as we explored our ability to modify crops and increase yields is that rye didn't increase in yield, but wheat and corn did. And so if you're a farmer, the opportunity to grow more per acre meant more money. And so rye became simply a less popular grain. It was also didn't make as nice, you know, bread wheat makes nicer bread. That's why they call it bread wheat. It's got a higher gluten content. Uh, it's a good, it's a, an effective product for that. So while the booze wasn't around for a few years, a lot of those things changed. And so coming out of the prohibition, you just don't have a lot of rye anymore. Now, again, that that's specifically American rye. The, the few distilleries that sort of were still around at the end of Prohibition and being bought up by the Kentuckians who were doing very well. And so we'll talk about a couple of those brands. Um, there are other kinds of rye whiskey. Specifically, most people think of rye whiskey as Canadian rye whiskey, which is essentially no standard at all. Uh, back in the in the pre-Prohibition era, the Canadians grew rye extremely well, so a lot of their whiskeys had a lot of rye in them. But there was no standard to that, and there still isn't. So today you can call you can buy something called Canadian rye whiskey. It's got no rye in it. Although uh, at the same time, there are also Canadian rye whiskeys that are almost 100% rye. But again, no standard. Uh, a lot of existing well-known brands are now making a rye. Angel's Envy's got one. Dickel has one. Knob Creek makes a rye. Rittenhouse makes a rye. But if you talk about the original rye whiskeys, the pre-prohibition rye whiskeys, almost all those brands are gone. One of the very few you can still find is Old Overholt, which was literally from the early 1800s in Pennsylvania. And they did not survive prohibition. Their assets were sold off and bought by Jim Beam, which now produces that, that product in their style with a high rye amount. And that is not the whiskey I wanted to talk about. The specific whiskey I wanted to talk about was from Leopold Brothers. 
So Leo Pro Brothers is a modern distillery. So these are two brothers. Todd studied brewing in the 90s. He wanted to be a brewmaster. He actually apprenticed in Europe, came back home. His brother, Scott, was an in, studied industrial engineering, manufacturing, and so forth. And they made beer for a while in Michigan and then got into distilling, found it way more fun. And in the early 2000s, they quit on brewing, built a facility in Colorado specifically to make whiskeys. And being Scott was more of the historian too. And he found some of these old recipes from the 1800s for whisk, for rye whiskeys. And they started experimenting with it. So they opened their facility in 2014. And they're pretty old school in some respects. So they still do four malting. We talked about this in, in the Scottish series, talking about malting. So they malt their own barley, which takes about a week. They've done, while they're sticking to the old style, I've noticed, I've seen some videos of some of their facilities. They've got these ultra smooth concrete floors so they can do a little bit more mechanical handling of the malt. And but they use European drying kilns, like they're they're following a lot of standards. So they've got their own barley. But their big thing it, it, when making their rye is that they use a super old school rye called a Bruzzi rye. So this is out of the Abruzzo region in Italy, which again been growing rye for centuries. Ah. And it's a very low starch rye. So I it doesn't make red. Uh, and so they've managed to be, Abruzzo rye is pretty popular these days in, in a sort of eclectic areas, but because it's a low starch rye, it has very little gluten, so it's good for brewing, but not for much else. Hmm. Uh, and its yield is low. So while it was popular pre-prohibition, again, you get back to farmer switched crops because it wasn't good for bread. They went to other things, and so it kind of died out. Um, but they, you know, you don't malt rye; you just grind it, and they they do all of that. They have their own uh, mashing techniques. They use fairly high temperature mashing, about 140 degrees Fahrenheit. They use Cypress uh, tank for fermentation, which is super old school. These are open top. They're actually encouraging lambic yeast as well. So while they use a blend of brewer's yeast, uh, which you both reacted so positively to as yeast creams. <laughs> uh, oh, they, oh, you remember. Yeah, yeah. I think you remember. <laughs> they then uh, they So they're, a normal fermentation with a yeast cream like that is pretty quick within 48 hours or so yeast is already dying off because it consumed all the sugar but they actually hold it in another tank in the tank for another 48 hours to allow the slower yeast and the, the slower bacteria the lactobacillus and so forth to quote sour the mash so those are actually bacteria that sustain themselves in the wood and so though it's not as fast acting as these re yeast creams they do create their own flavor um, there's a bunch of ways to approach sour that that different distilleries approach, but this is super old school. Now, there's two different ryes that they make, uh, neither of which I can find in Canada, which is very frustrating. And the one I'm going to I, I'm going with first is their Maryland style rye, 100 proof, which is 50% ABV. If you can find it, I, apparently it's available in Total Wine for about 70 US. The mash bill on this is 65% rye, 15% so, corn, 20%. Can I can I ask you a question about this? So yeah. I, I, it seems to me that as craft distillery uh, activity grows and grows and grows, it's a big thing. Mm -hmm. This is maybe the next extension because rye usually to me has much more of a kind of a bite to it than bourbon, yes. which is very smooth. Yeah. Well, so it, is, and normally when we make bourbon, we use rye as the flavor grain, the middle grain. Yeah. And it has that it, spiciness to it. But we're, yeah, yeah. It, it it's sharp. It's sharp, sharp like a scotch can be sharp, right? Yes. A um, the flavor from bourbon comes from the wood. Is yeah. that the same but it, with? But the with sweetness comes from the corn. Like yeah, bourbon yeah, yeah. actually has a strong sweet flavor. Especially when you get weeded bourbons. Think Blantons or. Mark. I wonder if very little rye bite. doesn't. I'm sorry. No, no. I, I wonder if it doesn't appeal to a growing base of kind of um, whiskey enthusiasts. You know who. Want the the more Want complex, more yeah, yeah, maybe. Well, and, and I would argue, for, especially when you talk about like Dickel making rye on the side, that they are taking Dickel their, making rye on the side is a beautiful because episode, they maybe. normally make bourbon, right? So they are <laughs> yeah. they are starting to make a, a rye that they are trying to appeal to a different audience. This is a very different product because of the yeah. abruzzi rye. It has a it's not as spicy. It's more floral. Yeah. Okay. So it, it has a different character to it. 
and, floral and, like a gin is floral or yeah not botanical but more you know complex flavor nodes like it, that's what it's known mm. for it's just okay. doesn't go high yield so it makes it expensive i mean it's a 70 dollars bottle I, I don't think i've ever run into anything like this i think that's the issue that's the appeal to me and it was my friend eric that put me onto this and i started reading and i'm like huh like now i gotta go find one of these right but i, I haven't been able to find one there's another hmm. version they make that I'm trying to hunt down because they bought a three chamber still. <sighs> this is super old school. Like, to, you know, the, a normal column still, which is what they're making their Maryland style with, is a continuous operation where you're you're preparing you're preparing your mat your 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 um wort on one side and you're able to continuously feed it in the still so you crank a lot of yield out. A three chamber still is a very primitive version of a column still, where rather than having lots of thin plates, it has three large plates, and it's not efficient. Its production rate is really low. Like ever since the 1800s, when when we got the coffee still running, like there was no reason to run a still like this anymore, except that it has really interesting flavor characteristics. And so, what they call the three chambers rye, which is much more expensive. It's like a two hundred fifty dollar bottle of whiskey. They're using this old fashioned still, and with a thumper, which is a great term. Yeah, you got this. It's a quite a large, bulky uh, columnar still with three distinct layers into it. And so, as it's heated, the, the vapors come up, and then they land in the second chamber where they cool a bit. And then they get hotter again, and they'll go up to the next chamber. So it's kind of a slow process. It's maybe. 10% or even 5% of the production rate of a regular still. And it needs routine cleaning because you're putting the, ma the mash in, the wart in. And then the thumper is actually comes off the lie arm. And they call it a thumper because, you know, stills don't run continuously, really. They sort of build up heat and then a certain amount of the distill distillate comes down the lie arm. And when it lands in this pot still, it thumps. It makes a sort of a bang, which is why it gets called a thumper. But it's a second stage or a separate stage of pot distillation that then rises up and goes through the condenser. It's just like these guys have really hybridized a modern operation with some really old school technique. Like I really want to sit down with both of these bottles and drink them side by side. Because and I would like to watch you do it because then I could have some too. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I, and I, I mean, I've, I've been thinking about talking about rye for a while just because it has its own character. There's no two ways about it. And it does seem to be making a resurgence, although most of the time it's bourbon makers who are like, oh, you want a rye? Well, here's a rye. We just tinkered with the mash, right? Um, but this, these guys are approaching rye like it's 1820. Like hmm. it's way back. It's pre-coffee still. It's pre yeah. any of this. Not I visit. think that speaks to this whole movement of craft distillery in a way, right? I mean, uh, I know it's not the same as the mom and pop store, but I mean, yeah. going back to the, this is a great way to differentiate. Yeah. And just to make it, it's like, hey, you really like whiskey? Why don't you try it? Like I think about um, Glenn Livett's Nadura and Shackleton as sort of these throwback whiskeys to get back, so let, get rid of the processes that yeah. they worked about in the 1970s when whiskey wasn't popular. It's like, make sure it doesn't get cloudy and make sure it, you know, works well with ice and these things. It's like, Oh no, I like whiskey for whiskey. So let's go drink more whiskey. That's my whiskey. <laughs> right. And, it's, and the uh, folks seem to have fallen into this in Colorado of all places. So I'm delighted. And it's like, I don't get a many missions these days for whiskey. I generally mm -hmm. know what I'm drinking. I'm excited. You know, you saw me find that Perth 23 and how delighted I was with that. Yep. But this is something I hadn't had a chance to explore. It's old school rise, and I want some. I think this is not I think rye, a lot of people are afraid of rice. They just a little too harsh. And, yeah, um, and I suspect this isn't because they switched up the grain. Yeah. You know? Okay. Hmm. That's uh, that's my story this week. As you know, now you eventually I'll find one and you'll see me drink it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but here in the states, we can find it readily, which is interesting. I, yeah, it's, it looks like it's around. So uh, I would certainly recommend the Maryland just because that's an old school approach to, well, to a rye whiskey. You, you are going to Seattle the, soon. The I mean. three chamber sounds more appealing to me. It sounds a little bit yeah. like for less of a just, hardcore. Just price. Right. right. Yeah. I think that's a $300 if you, it's, oh. like, it's like whiskey for adults. So when they yeah. say three chambers, they mean three Franklins. 300 yeah, yeah no. well okay. it's three chambers because it uses that different still and, and it's expensive yeah. but, 
what I like about this is not like it's not like Yamazaki Twelve where it won a bunch of awards and suddenly went from forty bucks to four hundred. Right. Yeah. This is a it actually it's actually expensive difficult to make. To yeah. make. Yeah. And right. so they charge. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, I guess I'm mm. off to Bevmo, and you guys are off to bed. It's uh, time to say good night to our it's... fabulous hosts. Windows Weekly mm-hmm. for this week, the first Windows Weekly of November 23. Uh, Paul Thorat is at Thorat.com. Become a premier member, a premium member, and you'll get access to some really great extra stuff that Paul writes. Uh, grammar checked and ready to go. <laughs> grammar checked twice. Twice. And read <laughs> by AI, out loud so you know, by AI. He also, uh, his book, The Field Guide to Windows 11, is uh, at, as you just heard, uh, leanpub.com. You'll get the field guide for Windows 10 inside, the sweet cherry filling. He also has Windows Everywhere, his newest book, which is about, which is great, kind of the history of Windows, all at leanpub.com. Richard Campbell is at runasradio.com. That's where his podcasts, Run As Radio and .NET Rocks, live, as does his image. <laughs> <laughs> and his right. incredible I'm not you know, perpetuity. Frankly, the 404 screens are great. I'm. I think I'm glad I saw the error screens. Trying to you make a it, lot of fun, buddy. Trying to make it error out. See what see what happens. Uh, we do this show every Wednesday, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. As you might know, we are going to Standard Time this Sunday because Halloween's over and the kids have all the candy, so we can now shift the clock, fall back. Uh, that means uh, we will be now at 1900 UTC. I have no uh, idea how you keep track of this. I just do some math in my head and hope it's right. Uh, you can, I only, and frankly, you don't need to do the math. You can watch it live, yes, at live.twit.tv. But you can also get a, a on demand versions of the show anytime you want and listen whenever you feel like it. I don't care what UTC you are. Uh, the uh, show is at twit.tv slash ww. There's a dedicated YouTube channel to Windows Weekly. Best thing to do, though, subscribe in your favorite podcast client because that way you'll get it automatically the minute it's available and you'll have it and you just listen at your leisure. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Richard. Have a great week. We'll see you next time on Windows Weekly. Bye-bye. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here. In case you hadn't heard, Home Theater Geeks is back. Each week, I bring you the latest audio video news, tips and tricks to get the most out of your AV system, product reviews, and more. You can enjoy Home Theater Geeks only if you're a member of Club Twip, which costs seven bucks a month. Or you can subscribe to Home Theater Geeks by itself for only $2.99 a month. I hope you'll join me for a weekly dose of Home Theater Geekitude.